Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the 11th meeting of 2019 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn off mobile phones or other devices to silent so they don't disrupt the meeting? We've got apologies this morning from Paula McNeill and Shona Robinson, who unfortunately can't make it here this morning. And agenda item one is decision on taking items in private. The committee is asking you to take item four, consideration of evidence here during uh, this meeting this morning in private. Is that agreed? OK. Thank you. We now move to agenda item two, social security support for housing. This is the penultimate evidence session of the committee's inquiry into social security support for housing. And this week's session is comprised of two panels. And I can now welcome our first panel this morning. And that is Beth Reed, Senior Policy Officer from Crisis, and Ashley Campbell, Policy and Practice Manager, Charter Institute of Housing Scotland. Thank you both of you for coming along uh, this, this morning. Good morning to you. Uh, and we'll move straight to questions. Our first question from Keith Brown, MSP. Yeah, and just as uh, thanks uh, very much for coming along. I just noticed in the um, evidence you provided that you both have uh, real concerns about the freeze on LHG rates, um, and uh, think the freeze should be lifted with immediate effect and revised to be brought in line with the actual cost of renting. And I, just for the volumes, I don't completely agree with that. But on the other side, um, is one of the concerns that the um, lifting of the freeze would in turn lead to inflationary pressures within the housing market. And am I right or wrong to think of it as a, a little bit analogous to London waiting, where London waiting itself starts to stoke up prices and cost of living as well? But I'd just be interested in your views on that. Uh, Beth Reid? Yeah, we, we've done some analysis looking at um, the affordability of um, properties within the LHA rate ac across Scotland. So we found that in um, 15 out of 18 in, of the different areas in Scotland, there's a monthly shortfall between the amount of LHA that you can that you can get and the amount of um, uh, money that LHA tenants will receive. So there's already a big gap there. Um, so in terms of uh, whether that will put rents up, we're already looking at the bottom end of the market. Um, so even if you, it, we're recommending that you raise back up to the 30th percentile. So I think I don't think there's going to be a huge amount of pressure um, kind of rising up all the way through. The, uh, the market. I think, you know, if you're looking somewhere like Lothian, where there's huge pressures in the market already and the rents are rising quite quickly, there's there's lots of other issues that are kind of pushing that up, which I, I think LHA would, would just be a very, very small component of that. If you're looking at things like Airbnb, for example, I think that's having a big impact on, the, on um, rents within in, in the Lothian area in particular. Um, in our evidence as well, we highlighted the shortfalls um, between LHA in the 30th percentile. As Beth said, that's still looking at the very bottom of the market. This isn't looking at the market as a whole. Um, I think the other point that's worth making is that one of the, the justifications or the reasons um, around the, the freeze being introduced was to dampen down the market. And the idea being that um, an LHA cap or an LHA freeze would help to keep rents um, more affordable. Um, and we know that that's not been the case. Um, the Scottish Government's um, own statistics on rent in the private rented sector um, released last year showed that um, between 2010 and 2018 there was a cumulative increase um, in the rent for two bedroom home which is the most common size of home in the private rented sector um, the increase was 21.6 percent um, the largest increase was in four bedroom homes that was 33.3 percent and that's compared to cpi over the period of 18.7 percent so we're seeing that rents are increasing um, over and above inflation anyway, regardless of this freeze being in place. Um, it's also important to note that that increase isn't, um, isn't even across the whole private rented sector, of course. There are areas where it's increasing a lot faster. Edinburgh, as you mentioned, is a particular hotspot. There are also other areas in the private rented sector where rents are going down, probably most notably Aberdeen and Shire. Um, obviously, there was um, um, the decline in the oil industry, the, the rents in Aberdeenshire have actually gone down in recent years, and it shows that the, the market is quite volatile, um, and that's not being reflected in LHA. I'm interested that in lots of the evidence sessions that we've had, the um, situation in Edinburgh becomes the one everyone mentions about, but there's obviously a big world out there, uh, out with Edinburgh, including my own um, constituency, and it's sometimes difficult to work out what the impact of these things are. Elsewhere, but one thing that I think other members will be asking about later on is the supply of private uh, rented housing um, for um, recipients of benefit. And I just wonder whether you think that the lifting of 
the LHA cap would in turn lead to a better supply of um, private uh, sector rented housing? I think it would certainly lead to better access for people who are claiming benefits. Um, within our evidence, we talked about the financial shortfall, but we also looked at the proportion of the market that would be available to um, people who are claiming benefits. And I think that if the LHA cap was lifted and if um, LHA was reinstated at the 30th percentile, or ideally maybe even the 50th percentile, which is what it was before it was um, reduced in the first place, that would open up a lot more of the market to people who are claiming benefits. It would also give a lot more certainty to landlords mm. um, that their tenants were able to cover the rent. We did some, uh, we did some analysis in the um, kind of wider Inverness region. So what we called in a Murray Firth, um, we looked at 212 properties there. And within that, four properties were available within LHA rates. One of those was a caravan, um, which we wouldn't particularly consider settled accommodation, but that was what was available if people went on to top up their LHA through their own incomes by 20%, they could access, I think it was another 19 properties. Um, the other issue you've got alongside that, though, that we, we came across about just under half of those prop half of the properties advertised were saying things like no DSS or no housing benefits. So uh, I think there's, there's a wide range of issues around access, um, including, you know, reluctance to let to people on, on benefits for, for a range of reasons. But I think, as Ashley says, it's, it's, it would certainly improve access if you could get, um, if, if LHA rates were, were able to meet more of the market rents. Okay. okay. Uh, Alice Rowan. Um, thank you, uh, convener. Um, we've heard um, quite a bit of evidence in and around the committee uh, around uh, the issue of rent arrears and particularly uh, the different views that exist about, exist about whether uh, the introduction of universal credit has had an impact on that. So I was just keen to have your take on, on uh, whether you see a connection between the two things. We, um, we work across well, we work across Scotland, but we have specific uh, homelessness services in Lothian and East Lothian. Um, so uh, we're certainly finding that in in both of those areas, landlords are much more reluctant to rent to people who are on benefits. There's a, a real concern about that. And we've been told in East Lothian that supported accommodation providers there won't rent to anybody with any sort of rent arrears, no matter what the cause of that, whether that's benefits or anything else. And that's that's... A, you know, a real issue for many of the people that we work with. Yeah. But do you, do you see a connection per se between the role of universal credit and the fact that some people? I'm thinking perhaps of the fact that um, there is this. There is, of course, the five week. It's not unique to universal credit. I appreciate there have, it has been the case with other benefits, but there is the the five week wait time period to get the first payment. Has that got an impact on, on rent arrears? So we've got a lot of anecdotal evidence. We've done surveys with local authorities and with rent deposit guarantee schemes across Scotland, and that they're they're making a lot of connections between <coughs> welfare reforms and um, finding it more difficult to use the private rented sectors, um, finding increases in homelessness. We don't have direct evidence to say that the rent arrears coming out of universal credit are causing that, but that's certainly what local authorities are are implying to us, and what rent deposit guarantee schemes are, are, are saying as well. Yep. Um, I think, as you said, you'll already have heard in this committee that there's an awful lot of evidence from the social rented sector, certainly, about the increase in rent arrears that's being linked with universal credit. You've probably also heard that some of those um, may be technical arrears. It may be to do with delays in benefits. It's that first five-week waiting period um, that local authorities and um, registered social landlords are working with tenants to make up those rent arrears. Um, but there is this backlog which is causing issues with... Um, rental income, with their business plans, so there are real issues for social landlords. I think there's probably less evidence um, in the private rented sector, but I also think that because of the way um, private landlords' businesses are run, there may be less scope for them to be able to deal with those mm. delays in the payments coming through. Um, the vast majority of private landlords have one or two homes. This might not even be um, their, first, the, their first or only job. Um, it, it's much more difficult for them to, to be able to deal with these large um, gaps in payments, particularly at the beginning of a claim, and for them to, to be able to support a tenant through that, I think is a lot more difficult than for a social landlord who are set up with the support mechanisms in place um, and with um, a lot more staff to, to help the, the tenant through that claim. Is it, is it your view that in that case, given the dif difficulties you're describing, that we should have as a default position 
that the rent is paid to the landlord rather than the individual. I appreciate there are no flexibilities around that, but is that is that something you feel should be the default position? I think that that's it's quite a complex question, and I don't think it's quite as simple as the rent being paid by default to the tenant or to the landlord in every single case. Um, the Chartered Institute of Housing's position um, on direct payments was that tenants should be given the choice. Obviously, the Scottish Government has implemented Scottish choices and um, claimants are now being given the option to have those payments made direct to their landlord if they want to. Um, I think the committee has probably heard already as well that there are issues with how those choices are being implemented. So if a, a claimant decides to have their payment made directly to their landlord, that's not happening necessarily on the first payment. Or if there's an issue or a delay, it's maybe not happening on the second or even the third payment. That's not an issue with the choice itself. That's an issue with the way that that is being administered. Um, so I think that there are issues of principle, should a person have the right to choose or not. There are also practical issues as well, with payments being made directly to landlords. There are several issues with that. So firstly, we've talked about that administrative issue of maybe payments not being made um, from the first um, payment after the choice is made. There are issues with uh, a delay in direct payments being made. So, for example, if a, if a claimant um, receives their universal credit on a date, say today the 25th, and they have decided to have their housing payment paid directly to their landlord, that's not necessarily made on the same day. The housing element is removed and held separately. That is paid to landlords in bulk on a four-weekly cycle. So if that four-weekly cycle has just been missed, say the four-weekly cycle happened yesterday, my universal credit claim comes through today, my rent doesn't go to my landlord for another four weeks. Um, so that in itself is an issue. I think the DWP is aware of that and they're working to rectify that. But again, that's not, that's not an issue with the choice. That's an issue with the administration of the system. Um, the other complication as well, I think that looking at whether a, a payment should be made directly or not is quite a simplified way of looking at it. Um, a lot of people might say tenants don't want to have the responsibility or they want the peace of mind that their rent is being paid direct to their landlord and they don't have to worry about that. And that's fine. Um, and that might work where when, where a tenant is being paid full housing benefit or the full housing costs. There are a lot of cases where tenants are being paid partial benefit or where they have fluctuating wages. Their universal credit claim might change from one month to the next. So direct payment might pay part of the rent to the landlord, but they would still then need to see how much was left over and pay that themselves out of other income. So it's not quite as simple, I don't think, as saying that in 100% of cases it should be paid direct to the landlord or that it should always be paid directly to the tenant. I think it's it's more complex than that. Okay, thank you. Okay, can I maybe just follow up on a little bit of that? Because I was looking at a submission we had from COSLA, and they're, they've been gathering data um, quite systematically, as much as possible, in relation to rent arrears, um, and where they're like maybe to universal credit rollout. And they looked at the the, the local authorities where it went live earliest, uh, that, that, that rollout, East Lothian, Highland, Inverclyde, Eastern Barnsard, and Midlow, they now remove Inverclyde from that for a moment because they, they don't really have their own their own housing stock. But in the two years from the 31st of March 2016, it was estimated that rent arrears increased by 26%. And I would say that that cause that are not clear how much of that is attributed to universal credit, but they believe it's a significant and, and major amount. And they put a figure on that of £5.7 million pounds for Inverclyde, the largest social housing providers, Inverclyde Homes. Um, sorry, River, Riverclyde Homes, I apologise. Um, in a similar period of time, I think about two and a half years, it was a 35% increase in, in rent arrears. Um, so that, that's a gap in financing to local authorities and to social housing. I think you'll appreciate that's a, a significant uh, issue uh, for their cash flow and repairs and maintenance in their own business plans for all tenants, including the, the ones that are on universal credit. They estimated that that's about a bit less than 10% of the population of Scotland, so it's a very rough calculation, but that could be £57 million pounds or so in a couple of year period not, not being used. So there are significant issues in relation to, to rent arrears, so, so I'm sure you want to recognise that, but I suppose my question would be um, 
I'm all about choices. I think Mr Griffin, I should name-check him, he's quite assiduously argued this point as well at committee. Um, if the default position was, look, the money is going to go to the landlord with all the imperfections that exist that Ashley Campbell quite rightly pointed out, um, it would certainly address a lot of those revenue and rent area issues and then it's about that empowering choice to say, well, actually, no, I'm going to take control of all, all of the monies given to me uh, for myself. That would certainly uh, give comfort uh, to maybe vulnerable households that don't even identify themselves as vulnerable households and still empower households where that vulnerabilities don't exist to take control of all of their own finances. So when we're talking about not being as straightforward as, as you suggest, Ashley Campbell, I'm just wondering if the start position could be the money goes to the landlord with all the issues around that and understand that and then we looked the Scottish choice could be you can take control of your own money if you wish. I'm just wondering some thoughts around that and the issue of rent arrears for local authorities and housing associations. Uh, Ashley. certainly agree that there are significant issues with rent arrears um, for the social rented sector. Um, as I said and you've pointed out there's an awful lot of evidence to support that. Um, it's not just a case of um, chasing up those rents, it's a case of the knock-on effects that that has on business plans, on local authority and RSL's ability to support other tenants, their ability to build more affordable homes. There are wide-reaching um, implications um, for those rent arrears and, as you said, they're very significant. Um, I think on the question of whether the, the rent could be paid to the landlord by default and then the choice made to, to have that switch back to the tenant, I, I don't have any particular issue with that. Okay, Listen, thank you for that. Bethry, do you have any views on that? Yeah, I mean, I think given, you know, everything that Ashley said, um, we we don't have a, a kind of an issue with, with doing that either. Um, I think it may well make sense, but I think it's important to make sure there is choice for the tenant in, the, in there, but uh, I think whether it goes directly to the landlord or directly to the tenant as the first point is, is certainly a, a good question to, to be exploring. Okay, um, thank you. We'll move on now. Mark Griffin. Thank, thanks, Kavina. Um, to pick up on the issues of, of rent arrears and freezes to local housing, allowing some of um, some tenants in Scotland their way of getting round that have been discretionary housing payments to, to top up um, to cover that gap between LHA rate and actual, actual rent. I just wonder if you have any views on how successfully or, or not, or how difficult or not it has been for, for tenants to access discretionary housing payments to make up that shortfall? Um, I think we certainly welcome um, the use of discretionary housing payments to support people with their housing payments. And we've seen through um, mitigation of the bedroom tax that that's been very successful. It's maybe not the ideal way um, to make that payment, and the Scottish Government knows that. We're working with the GWP to make sure that that payment can be made directly um, through a top-up top to universal credit rather than going through discretionary housing payments. I think the issue with using discretionary housing payments to cover shortfalls like LHA is that the very nature of discretionary housing payments is that they're supposed to be discretionary and short-term. They're not guaranteed. Um, it's being used as a vehicle to mitigate the bedroom tax because that was all that there was um, that was available at the time. I think our preference would certainly be for local housing allowance to be increased rather than to use discretionary housing payment as a long-term fix for something that we know is, is not covering the basic cost of housing for people. The, um, the majority of DHP in Scotland is going on bedroom taxes, as Ashley says, and, and also to some extent on benefit caps. So actually there's only about £10 million of DHPs which is available for other purposes, such as, as LHA rates. So, um, and I think the budget is something like 40 or £50 million overall. So it's actually quite a small proportion of that that's available for things like topping up LHA. We'd also like to see DHP used more widely as a, as a homelessness prevention tool. So that might be topping up LHA rates. Sometimes that's things like um, rent in advance and, and, and things like that. We're, we're increasingly seeing demand for rent in advance from social landlords and others. So I think there's, um, uh, DHP isn't used terribly widely for topping up LHA because the majority of it is being spent on bedroom, ta uh, bedroom tax and, and uh, benefit cap. 
but I think we also it would be useful to look at whether we can use DHB and, and other funds that are available to the Scottish Government um, more generally as a homelessness prevention tool uh, and look at that as a kind of more holistic approach to, to, to supporting um, homelessness prevention. We heard evidence from Edinburgh City Council that they'd said that they had some difficulty in getting people to apply who would be eligible um, for a, a discretionary housing payment to, to support them um, meeting their rent commitment um, and that they were um, offering awards on a, an annual basis to cover shortfalls. That seemed to me to be a more um, generous provision than I'm aware of elsewhere. I don't know if you're aware of any um, variation across 32 local authorities as to um, how generous or not um, the the provision of DHP has been? It's not something we've looked at in, in great deal. Certainly all our, uh, the majority of our members are based, our clients are based in Edinburgh, so that's that's the system we're kind of most familiar with. And we certainly, I know the council highlighted they don't they have issues with people applying, and certainly we would always encourage our, our clients to, to apply for DHP and support them to do that. So that's not necessarily something we would see through our client-based services. You spoke about how you think discretionary housing payments could be better used to prevent homelessness. Mm -hmm. For example, just now, um, local authorities are relying on guidance from um, the DWP as to how they administer and allocate the funds they have at their discretion. Um, do you think that the Scottish Government should um, issue new guidance to, to support local authorities and given a more um, uniform approach to support people across the country now that they have the power under the new Social Security Act? My understanding is that guidance is, is forthcoming. Is that, do you know more about that, May? Uh, I, th I think my understanding was that the Scottish Government was going to be look at, looking at developing their own guidance. And I think, as you say, it's an opportunity to look at the way that we're using DHPs here um, and to maybe clarify what, what they could or should be used for. I think... Um, Again, as Beth pointed out, the majority of DHP funding is being used to mitigate the bedroom tax, and I understand that that additional funding was put into the DHP pot for that very purpose. Um, some of the feedback that we've had from members is that it would actually be very useful to take that out again. I, I know, as I said before, the Scottish Government is looking at paying um, for the bedroom tax directly through universal credit, and that would certainly be helpful in terms of cutting down on the need for DHP applications in terms of making sure that people have an entitlement to that payment rather than a discretionary payment being made on their behalf. Um, but also in um, a bit of transparency, as Beth said, it looks like a big pot of money, but when you take out the amount that's been allocated to the bedroom tax um, or to um, the benefit cap or other welfare reform measures, there's not a lot of money left. So even just having that transparency would be useful. I think it's also worth noting that um, discretionary housing payments were never intended um, to be used specifically or only to cover welfare reform measures. Um, as Beth said, there's, there's wider uses um, that could be made of discretionary housing payment to support people who are at risk of homelessness. And again, that's maybe something that could be clarified um, through guidance for local authorities if that was developed by the Scottish Government. There's obviously a lot of work going on currently around ending homelessness through the Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan. Um, one of the things we uh, would like to see is, is better well, there will be more work within that about developing uh, duties around preventing homelessness in Scotland. We've got similar duties in Wales and England now. Um, and I think that DHPs, potentially the Scottish Welfare Fund, and also looking at um, the work that rent deposit guarantee schemes and private rented sector access schemes do around Scotland in terms of uh, providing bonds and that kind of thing uh, to, to help pay for deposits, pay for rent in advance. All of that could be joined up, um, and I think it would be really good to do that as part of the preventing homelessness work, but make sure that the DHP guidance and, and future guidance on, on how the Social Welf Scottish Welfare Fund works could be joined up really really effectively, potentially, to, to make sure that there's a good underpinning for some of that work and, and really get that kind of cross-government and, and joined up working going on. Okay, thank you. Okay, can I just maybe follow up a little bit of DHPs? Um, now... Again, COSLA were advising us about restrictions and how quickly local authorities or housing associations could, could move to, to identify where DHPs could, could be applied. 
and I'll, I'll, I'll just maybe quote from their submission. Says, Local authorities are not advised by DWP of tenants or claimants whose payments have been reduced by the application of either the bedroom tax or the benefit cap in universal credit cases and can only provide such support when claimants come forward, even when support is an offer. COSLA has previously raised with DWP, and we'll, we'll chat with DWP later this morning in an evidence session, whether they, they could share information in such cases with local authorities. We believe that they have the power to do for the purpose of welfare assistance, but today that has not been prioritised to DWP. In terms of information sharing and the quick and speedy application of uh, discretionary housing payments. Is there more that has to be done in terms of that information sharing? Is that something you're aware of or that, that COSLA has raised with us? I think that would certainly be helpful. I've not heard specifically of that being an issue in relation to DHPs, but certainly it being an issue in relation to social landlords being able to identify people that need support. So that I guess this is uh -huh. just a, another circumstance in which people may need support and local authorities or RSLs might be in a position to be able to provide that support if they had um, that information from the DWP. Um, I know that feedback from our members is suggesting that social landlords certainly have much better communication channels with the DWP now. Um, they've been working for a number, of, a number of years on this. Obviously, they have um, trusted partner status and the landlord portal, which has been really useful, but I think there's still some way to go. Okay, thank you. It's not an issue that we've come across, but given that DH, DHPs and housing benefit used to be all administered by the local authority and now that's kind of being split up, it, it makes sense that those communication issues are, are uh, maybe not as strong as, as they were previously. And um, yeah. Okay, so it could be an emerging issue, but thank you for responding to that. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you very much. I'd just like to touch on the, the crisis submission says that analysis of the experiences of a thousand homeless people in the welfare system found that one-fifth, 21%, of people became homeless because of a sanction and 16% had to sleep rough. Um, so these are clearly very shocking figures. And I'd just like to ask whether those are UK figures or specific to Scotland? They are from across Britain. Okay, yeah. So we might so expect a Scottish proportion. Yeah, oh, and so in our Skylight work uh, with, with clients who have been, who are or have been homelessness, it, Homeless, so it's something that we, we come across. So we, we've been working with a guy recently, for example, who has had uh, three consecutive sanctions, um, partly as a result of... Well, the first one came about because he was asked to move his mobile home and by the police and therefore missed a, a job centre appointment. Uh, they then rearranged the appointment... Um, uh, through his online journal, but he didn't have access to that because he was in a very rural area and didn't have access to a mobile phone or to, or to, to internet. And he's been uh, five months without money. Um, he, we have put in a mandatory reconsideration for him, but that's taking 120 days at the moment to to process. When he he's, I think he's now got his money, but he will be repaying um, hardship payments out of that. He's been offered temporary accommodation, and as res um, but he's going to struggle. To, sorry, he's he's been offered permanent accommodation, but he's going to struggle to take that up because um, he's going to struggle to pay rent in advance. He's going to struggle to pay for his gas, his heating, and 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 so on. So, it's certainly something uh, that is a real challenge for for some of the people we work with. So. Uh it, is it the position of um, Crisis and the Chartered Institute that sanctions are a driver of homelessness? I mean, the evidence that, that you've quoted that we, that we uh, commissioned, I think that was from Sheffield Hallam University, shows that we would like to see um, that uh, th um, there should be um, much more clarity about what's going on for people before a sanction is, is, is imposed on somebody so that um, sanctions aren't imposed in situations that will cause homelessness. And I noticed that um, Crisis is working with five Edinburgh job centres um, to raise awareness of homelessness among staff, because obviously, you know, if we make someone homeless, there are, there are societal costs. It's, it's, not a, it's not a money saving exercise, is it, in terms of the person's health and their impact and their ability to, to gain employment and so on. This is a, a really drastic step. So. I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about this. How, how did that partnership come to be? Why was it thought that it was necessary and what's coming out of it? So it's, it's come about over um, a few years of working with, with the job centres and, and we've kind of... Um, I, mean, I, I would say that 
um, some of that came initially about through personal relationships and, and building contacts there. Um, and there was somebody in one of the job centres in Edinburgh who'd had who, working in the in the job centre, but who'd had personal experience of homelessness himself. So it came about through those. Um, we've been doing uh, kind of joint team meetings and and going in and doing training together, uh, those kind of things. Um, and we've seen really positive results from that. So um, much greater understanding of uh, of people's situations, checking in with people about are they homeless or are actually are they actually just worried about their housing situation, and then discovering actually there's a lot of anxiety for a lot of people about their their housing, and and sometimes that is you know that's often their if if they're concerned about the stability of the housing, then looking for jobs on top of that has is. is really quite a challenge so the sorts of things that have been going on is, is change changes to the claimant commitment so that um it's reflecting more of, of the wider issues that they're facing and maybe reducing some of the work search requirements and so on um and we found it a really positive experience and actually in terms of sanctions in particular we we um we seem to have seen a reduction in the number of sanctions our members have, have been getting, um, and we think that's because there's more realistic work search requirements on, on those claimants. And uh, so it's, it's been really positive. Um, it's something that we've been doing um, in some other parts of, of Britain as well. So we've done some work like that in Coventry and also in Newcastle. Um, and we've been um, working with the Job Centre in terms of developing... Um, uh, a module around homelessness, so helping train. Um, so it, the module will go to help um, job centre advisors understand homelessness better. So I think that's going through at the moment, and that's that's a, at a, I think a GB level. So. Um, there's talk about uh, there's going to be specific points of contact within job centres um, around homelessness, um, and uh, that's beginning to come in at the moment. And, and we we hope that that will make a real positive difference for people who are homeless. It sounds very positive, particularly if it's having an impact on you know, lessening the number of sanctions and so on that are applied. And um, you know, we know about Edinburgh and now Coventry. So, do you think this is a model that has? Potential. Obviously, I appreciate that crisis is, you know, your resources aren't unlimited, but is this a model that could be rolled out by the DWP more widely across the UK in some shape or form? Yeah, I think having the, the specific points of contact within job centres is, is really useful. I think we, we need to make sure that there are people within perhaps every region or, or, or in clusters of job centres who have actually um, even greater in-depth understanding of homelessness so there can maybe point, be a point of a, a advice and so on. Like you say, um, we, we have 11 skylights around Britain, so there's, there's a limit in terms of what we can do, but I think um, improved partnership working with with uh, other homelessness organizations can make a real difference i know homeless action scotland did uh, work in every job center in scotland a few years ago looking at the homelessness easement and applying that more effectively i think there needs to be an ongoing process of training and, and support and and making sure that um, those skill levels are constantly maintained especially if the staff turnover and so on but i think there's there's real positives that can be gained if if, if we work well together and, and the, there's good understanding of, of people's housing situations within job centres and within uh, the specific details of people's claim and commitments. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Okay, can I ask, do my Conservative colleagues want to come in at any point? Michelle Valentine. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested, good morning, sorry, um, what you have to say actually has been really interesting this morning and I'd be interested in exploring a little bit more around that because it sounds like the, the system allows the necessary changes to make things work on, on the ground. Um, how difficult has that been in terms of getting those changes to get, you know, positive, um, I suppose, support around homelessness? I think, like I say, it, it originated in some um, particular contacts and mm. uh, I think that those individual relationships can make or break. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really positive that um, there's now this uh, policy coming in of having these particular points of contact within within job centres. Like I said, I think it, there does need to be a higher level of expertise in addition to that to make sure that, that there is that accessible to job coaches. Um, so I think I think there is the possibility in the system to do that. I think some of the other issues that have been talked about in terms of the administration of the system um, and and some of the kind of complexity of the system 
do cause a different type of barrier, which still make a huge difference for whether people get the right entitlement. So I think there's an issue around making sure that the work search criteria are right and people are getting the right sort of support to, to do that and not getting sanctioned in, inappropriately. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the wider issue about making sure that people are getting the right uh, money at the right time mm -hmm. um, and, and getting sufficient money that they can actually afford housing in, in their area. On, on that note, going back to the, the LHA rates, um, which obviously are the backbone of some of this issue, if you like, in, in terms of ensuring that the levels of um, available benefit um, to someone will match the availability of um, rental accommodation. The LHA rate obviously is set at that sort of percentile, but as you've pointed out earlier, markets are fluctuating around that. How responsive have you seen the LHA rates being? I mean, is, is how often are they changed in response to movements in the markets? Because obviously the market's on a demand and supply basis. You've already indicated some are going up rapidly as a result of demand or removal of opportunity with things like Airbnb. But where something goes down, do they stay up or do they get taken down? What's your experience of that? So LHA rates used to be in line with the market and then they were f they were um, reduced to increasing at CPI levels and, and for the last uh, three years, four years, they've been frozen altogether so they haven't changed at all. And that's why we're seeing such a big gap between the 30th percentile, which is what you should be able to afford and in a lot of Scotland we're seeing that halved so people are only able to access 15% of the market and they're obviously competing with everybody else looking for the cheapest accommodation in the market as well whether they're on benefits or not so um, LHA rates aren't reflecting the market at the moment that's that's one of our kind of key key reasons for recommending that we re prior to the freeze did they move routinely monthly yearly I think it was yearly basis it's, prior to that so there was an Annually. annual change yeah. to them but the way that that's calculated is, um, uh, so in Scotland, it's Rent Service Scotland will go and do an evaluation of the market and they'll take a sample of the local area. Sometimes those samples are very small, so particularly around the shared accommodation rate, they can be extremely small, So, if the, because, just because there isn't much shared accommodation around. So if they take a very small sample, it, it means actually from year to year the, the, the rate can change quite a lot because mm. um, you know if you've got an extra three flats of shared accommodation rate f compared to the previous year and they're, they're a bit higher, then that, that will alter the rate quite a lot. So one of the things that we, we want to see is um, using using of the Scottish Landlords Register to um, so that um, Scottish Government would automatically get that information through from landlords about what the size of the property is and what the rents are. And then you could use that and you'd have a much better basis for setting LHA rates. All right, okay, so to get that as feedback, mm -hmm. that, that's very interesting. Thank you. Add to that. Um, yeah. Just to add to that, as, as Beth has said, um, the way that rental information is collected could be improved on, so we could have a lot more detailed information about local rents. I think another issue with local housing allowance is that it's based on very broad markets. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, even within Edinburgh, you can go one street down the road and the, the rents will be completely different. Um, the broad rental market area for Edinburgh is the Lothians. It's, it's a massive mm. geographical area and there's a lot of variation within that. So LHA is quite a, a blunt measure of, mm -hmm. of the price. Um, as Beth said as well, we're in year three of the LHA freeze. So LHAs are still revised every year, but they're not going up. They can still go down. Mm. So when rents are going down in a particular area, the LHA might go down. It can't go back up again because it because there's a freeze. Right. Um, so the way it's set out just now is in favour of LHAs coming down and, and not going back up again. Right. And can I, can I ask, um, in terms of, you, you talked earlier about the, the use of um, DHP and, and obviously being used around mitigating bedroom tax, etc. Obviously for people in private rented accommodation, there was no spare room subsidy. So are you seeing the stress there, because as I understand from, from some of crisis reports, it's really from the private rented sector that homelessness is increasing. Um, the social rented sector seems to be more stable in that sense. So what are, you, what are your thoughts about the pressures there in terms of, of because obviously the, I'm assuming there's the same issues around size of accommodation, availability, etc. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think there is a, a difference. So uh, um, just to clarify that in terms of homelessness, um, 
There is a major pressure, particularly in England, of uh, homelessness being coming from the private rented mm -hmm. sector. We don't see that so much in Scotland. Um, I mean, the biggest cause of, of homelessness in Scotland is, is relationship breakdown. Mm -hmm. um, we did some research. We did a we commissioned survey for the homelessness monitor, and that found about 37% of Scottish local authorities were saying that uh, they were seeing homelessness increase from the private rented sector. So it certainly is an issue in some places, but not everywhere. Um, in terms of, of the pressures, I think there's a difference in the type of accommodation you get in the private rented sector compared to the social rented mm -hmm. sector. So a lot of social rented sector accommodation has been built to accommodate families, yeah. whereas you get a kind of wider range of properties in, in the private rented sector. So there is more flexibility. I mean, that's why we see it as, as, as one, f for some people, a really good route out of homelessness and, and preventing homelessness as well, because there is flexibility in terms of location, in terms of size, and so on. So it, it can be a really useful route out. We aren't seeing the pressures that we've been seeing in England um, in terms of generating homelessness, but that is increasing in some areas. I mean, Edinburgh would be an obvious place. Mm. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think things like the private, the new private rented tenancy will help with some of that stability. But um, if, if we continue to see big uh, rental increases, that will put pressure on homelessness from the, from the private sector. Okay, thank you. Okay, Alison Johnson. Yeah, um, when uh, the committee went to visit um, individuals and organisations to discuss the the sort of interaction of social security with housing in Leith a few weeks ago. Um, the group that I was with met a couple of uh, young single parents who had both been impacted by the benefit cap and had been served notice to quit. Um, so we, we had a wider discussion around that, but it seems, you know, that's obviously a huge challenge, but just picking up on Ashley Campbell's point about that, the broad market rental areas, I mean, you know, obviously Scotland is a, a very diverse. There are all sorts of things happening with different pressures in different areas. But, you know, the fact that Edinburgh within Lothian, it, it's, you know, it's not entirely representative. I just wondered if, if the DWP are taking, you know, are they taking note of the fact that this could be actually quite unhelpful? I'm not sure of the DWP's specific view on this. Um, the local housing allowance... Um, structure has been in place for quite some time and the market areas have always been very broad um, and as we've already discussed there have been criticisms of the system so firstly that the we don't have the, the richness of data that we would like to be able to inform um, the, the local housing allowance rates um, and secondly that because we're looking at very wide ge geographical areas um, it, it's you know maybe not, not the best tool to use I guess the difficulty is the the more um, the more areas you look at, the, the more complex the system becomes. So, for every broad rental market area um, in Scotland, you have four different rates, five different rates. So, the shared accommodation rate: one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, and four bedroom. And um, there's 19 of those across Scotland. And the more you multiply that, you know, the more complex the system becomes. The more rates there are um, to calculate. So, I guess there there's maybe a need to. Uh, I would certainly say it would be worth looking at the system. Um, but I guess there would need to be some kind of balance between the complexity of the system, the, ad the administration of that, the costs of that, um, yeah. and what we end up with. I think the argument is that whatever size of rental market area you look at, there's always going to be issues and variations within that. But I do think it's interesting that Scotland has, I think, 18 BRMAs. Uh, Wales has 22. So one of our BRMAs, Scotland, which is Highland and Ireland, is larger than all of Wales <laughs> put together. So I think I think there is maybe a particular issue in, in terms of the size of some of the BRMAs in, in, in Scotland in that they are huge and nobody's going to expect somebody to travel from Thurso to Inverness for a job. BRMAs are meant to be based on the kind of what's a reasonable travel area. And if you're looking at travelling from Stornoway to Inverness for, for shopping or for a job, you know, that, that is a huge area that we're, that we're talking about. And the same with, you know, Aberdeen and Shire is a very, very big area. Lothian is a very, very big area. So we're looking at lots of different um, uh, housing markets and job markets within those. So I, I do think there might be a question about Scotland in particular in that, in that I think the BRMAs in Scotland are particularly big compared to other parts of Britain. Okay, thank you. Very helpful, thank you. Okay, can I just ask, um, I think the suggestion to Michelle Ballantyne was the Scottish Government, in conjunction with local authorities and the Landlord Register, 
has a lot more localised granular data now at its disposal if it uses it wisely to actually get a real grip on what what the 30th percentile really means for each local authority area. Maybe that information is not being brought together effectively. Could you say a little bit more about that? I found that exchange quite interesting. I think just to clarify, um, the Scottish Government and the, the Landlord Register does not collect data on rent at the moment. Okay. There's been a suggestion from some that it could be used um, to, to gather more data. Okay. Um, I think there are issues in, in terms of LHA calculations, um, but you'll also be aware of the new um, provisions that have been brought in in the private rented sector around rent controls and rent pressure zones, so the discretionary power for local authorities to be able to apply caps to rent in specific areas. Local authorities are finding it very difficult to use those powers just now because they don't have the evidence there to support the implementation of rent pressure zones, so that would be another potential um, application if we had that kind of data. We, we just don't have it at the moment. Okay, now, and I'm conscious that this is a social security committee and it's not a committee in relation to, to, to housing, but how social security and housing, that connectivity and how social security can better support that. But does the Scottish um, Government have some powers to vary? You see housing cost elements as things currently stand, and could they alter the calculation of LHA rates in any way to better reflect localised inflationary um, pressures, for example, what is the scope for, because a lot of this, quite rightly, is in relation to the UK government, there will be aspects where the Scottish government maybe can, can do more or at least consider more. Any comments on that would be quite, quite helpful. So, um, Scottish government has some powers over some of the regulations around universal credit, which include um, LHA levels. Um, I mean, I've, I've looked at those in some detail and I think it's, it's quite complex what could or couldn't be done, and I think it's it's relatively small changes. I think there could be things, for example, around the shared accommodation rate and the exemptions that are allowed around that. There are um, potentially LHA rates could be varied, but I think it's it's it is quite a complex area, and it, um, you you need to kind of look at that legislation in a, in a lot of depth <laughs> with a lot more of expertise than I have to do that. Um, I think the other question, well, I think there's a couple of questions around there. What would be the cost um, of that? And I think it, it could be very, it could be very challenging for the Scottish government to meet those costs. We, um, I mentioned in our submission, we're doing some uh, analysis that we've commissioned at the moment, which is looking at what would it actually cost to raise uh, LHA levels to the 30th percentile, and we'll have that broken down for Scotland. So that would co cover some of the kind of more detailed things I'm, that I. I I've kind of maybe just mentioned, but um, that would give an overall sense of what that kind of cost would be for Scotland if, if it did decide to use some of those powers. Um, I think the other thing that you need to consider within that is how much more complexity we're introducing in, in the system. And I don't think that's necessarily an argument against it, but I think it, it's something we really need to consider. Um, we've got the Scottish flexibilities already, and there's some kind of complicated interactions with, with the wider system in that. Um, and... I suppose our sense would be that actually any changes like that, we probably we want to focus on, on Westminster making them at first so that they benefit everybody in Britain, but also so that it doesn't make the system more and more complex. What we wouldn't want to see is Scottish government mitigating something in a particular way and then a, a year or two down the line, Westminster doing the same thing, but in a different way, and then you, you're just getting um, a lot more variation in the system. So but that's the opposite. It would, it would be mitigation and it would, it would, come, it could, would come with a cost. I, yeah. think I just wanted to clarify whether yeah. the yeah. Scottish government had scope to change some of that criteria and whether that that additional money would be picked up at a Scottish level or a UK level, but it would be Scottish Government mitigation if that was to happen? Um, I think it would come out of Scottish Government budget. Yeah. Okay, don't you want to add anything to that, Ashley? Um, I guess if you look at it very simply, the Scottish Government would be able to top up the housing element of universal credit in the same way it's looking to do so for the bedroom tax. Um, as Beth has pointed out, that would have a cost, a financial cost for the Scottish Government. Um, and again, our preference would be for the, the Westminster government to reverse the cuts that it's made to, to local housing allowance. Um, so the Scottish government would have to consider whether they, want, they wanted to pay that cost for the top-up itself, for the administration. Um, obviously, the, the legislation allows for the Scottish government to make those changes, but they would still need to be approved by the, the UK government. They would need to work with the DWP to set up that system. I think we've seen with the bedroom tax that it's not quite as simple as just paying the money, that's why it's, it's not being done through universal credit already. Um, you also need to look at the issue of the overall cap on benefits. 
I think we found that when the Scottish Government tried to um, implement the, the legislation to allow for the bedroom tax to be mitigated through universal credit, we found that in some cases that was going to push some people over the, bed, the, over the benefit cap limit and then that money would be taken away um, from the other side. Uh, the, the regulations that were introduced, I think, through the Social Security Act have um, addressed that issue, but specifically for the bedroom tax, I'm not sure if additional legislation or regulations would be required to do the same thing if you wanted to top up. No, that's it. The question wasn't inspired by a, a, what should or shouldn't be mitigated. It was in relation to the mechanics of the powers the Scottish Government does or doesn't have at its disposal. So there are some, but they're quite complicated in relation to calculating LHA rates, um, which, which, which is interesting. Um, can, I, can I ask another question? Because we've talked about the shared, shared room rate, and I'm not sure of how many... Uh, 30, under 35 year olds in my constituency that's told, well, here's, here's your shared room rate, uh, go and find a flatmate in the private rented sector and we'll cover that rent, hopefully. They just go and get uh, accommodation themselves and then there's a shortfall. So what would your position be on um, the, the shared room rate or the LHA rates for those under, under 35 in relation to how the social security system is helping those under 35 or are actually hampering them or put them at more risk? I think the shared accommodation rates are a real challenge for a lot of people. There isn't a culture of sharing accommodation in most of Scotland. Where there is, it tends to be student accommodation, um, which is maybe uh, perhaps a different kind of group of people. Um, so I think there are real issues with both access and affordability in, in the shared accommodation rate in particular. Um, and we know that uh, where people are sharing they're often having to top up their LHA and if particularly if they're under 25 they're on a lower minimum wage they're on a lower rate of uh, personal allowance within within the benefit system so they've got less resources to top that up so it's a it's a real challenge um, there so I think um, we obviously represent homeless people in particular and we want to see the exemptions to the shared accommodation rate extended um, so for example for people um, coming out of prison for people um, who might be offered housing first, who've got kind of more complex needs. Um, we, we'd want to see it extended for care leavers. It's currently up to 22 for care leavers. Um, and, and there's also some inconsistencies in, in the exemptions currently. So if you're over 25 and you've had severe mental health problems, there's an exemption, but there isn't if you're under 25. If, if you've been in, in homelessness accommodation and you're over 25, there's an exemption, but not again, not if you're under 25. So, so uh, making some of those much more consistent and making sure that, that people who are particularly in need of um, stable housing are able to access that, I think, is really important. Okay, Ashley Campbell, did you want to add anything? I think um, we share concerns about the, the shared accommodation rate and in particular the extension of that from under 25s to under 35s. Um, there doesn't appear to be any kind of justification for that apart from cost saving. Um, so we would um, strongly call for that to be reconsidered. Um, I think I would probably agree with your position and best that there's not necessarily a culture of, of sharing and it's, it's not an easy thing to do and a lot of young people will be looking to make up the difference um, in the, the rent shortfall. I'm just wondering, Beth, just, just briefly, you're talking about um, more exemptions in, in relation to that. Is that just a next step campaigning strategy? Would you rather just the shared accommodation rate went, or do you think it's OK to have a shared accommodation rate at, at, for 30, up to 35 year olds, but as long as you put in exemptions, what, what actually is the position? I think it's a pragmatic position in terms of uh, where we're at at the moment. As I say, we are costing what it would be to increase 30th, uh, LHA rates to the 30th percentile. When we were doing that and um, kind of uh, co commissioning that analysis, we were looking at a, a range of scenarios. Could you put up um, the shared accommodation rate to a high level? What would happen to scrap that and so on? Um, and I think partly because of complexity and partly because of the practical costs of some of that. We haven't gone down that route. That's not to say that in an ideal world we wouldn't have a shared accommodation rate at all, um, I think. Okay. yeah, that, That's helpful. I know Keith Brown and Michelle Ballantyne want to come in, and there's one final question on homelessness we definitely have to ask before uh, the session's finished. We'll take Keith first and then Michelle. <coughs> I thought the answer that um, the Chartered Institute gave a couple of goals was really interesting on mitigation. We often get a very 
trite cliche that it's simply up to the Scottish Government to mitigate, use its new powers to mitigate this threat, and the practicalities are very different from that. The system itself prevents straightforward mitigation very often. But going back to the first question I asked about local housing um, allowances, it seemed to me that the response to that was the system already starts off with structural flaws and problems which then require mitigation and other things to take place to try and address the flaws in the system. And going back, therefore, to the point the Chartered Institute made previously in response to Mark Griffin about the discretionary housing payments in the welfare fund could be um, made more transparent. Um, it's not just about bedroom tax mitigation, but these other things should be taken into account. And I think underneath it all, and please let me if I'm wrong, was a request for more resources to do these other things, many of which, it seems to me, stem from flaws with the system in the first place. Would it not be more straightforward uh, to say it's the structural flaws in the system that have to be addressed first because I think Beth Reid said this in response to the endless complexity that's then built in trying to find ways to mitigate the structural flaws in the problem which they further bring the whole system into disrepute. So is it not the system in the first place that we should be focusing on? Our preference with regards to local housing allowance would certainly be for the UK government to reverse the cuts that have been made. I think if we're looking at the social security system in the widest sense and how it supports people with housing, then the most important thing is to make sure that people have enough income to live off of, and that takes into account their housing costs, but what do they have left after they've paid for that housing as well? I think it's also important to note that um, changes to people's housing allowance haven't been made in isolation. There's been cuts in other areas which impacts people's income as well. So we're seeing people who maybe they are managing to pay their rent, but they're not managing to pay for food or for their children's clothes or for other basic necessities. So I think that the social security system as a whole, we would like to see working better, but specifically in relation to local housing allowance, we would certainly um, firstly be looking for the, the UK government to, to take a look at the system and, and fix it for everyone. There's a danger that we get into the kind of wider housing system here, but you know there is an issue about supply and uh, we're investing a lot of money in um, housing benefit and, and, and you know, I think that's one of the reasons for the cuts is billions and billions and billions of pounds going into housing benefit. Um, and if you look at the historic trends, that, that's reversed. It used to be going to, into building houses and now it's going into paying rents for houses. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, there's much wider issues at stake here and, and ultimately we do need to invest in social housing. We need to make sure that if, um, rents are affordable. Um, you know, if the, if the overall market came down, then LHA rates would would come down with it, and it would be more more affordable. Um, you know, a lot of the, the the changes that have gone on have been to reduce the housing benefit bill, and uh, so I think a lot of the tweaking is now to try and correct what went wrong when that was implemented. Um, so I think there's, there's real challenges, um, which ultimately come down to a lack of housing um, and a lack of affordable housing in in Scotland and in Britain. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. Uh, interestingly, that's what I was going to ask you about. But um, So you've kind of answered that. Can I just ask a, a, a little clarification, though, when, on your earlier point around um, shared accommodation rates? You said there's not a culture in Scotland. Um, is there a different culture, then, in England and Wales when it comes to shared accommodation? I think certainly in London and South East, there's a lot more of a culture of sharing. I'm not sure about other parts of, of England and Wales. Um, but I think, to some extent, um, th there's a sense that that policy may have been developed on the basis of a culture that is, is specific to one part of England um, and not necessarily um, a appropriate for other parts of... of, of, of so based on affordability. Britain. Based on affordability and, and, I guess, at what point does... Um, a need for affordability become a culture. I think there is more of a culture in London and the South East of sharing up to a much older age than would happen in other parts of Britain. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And just a, a kind of final question to finish off. We're keen as a committee uh, to explore two aspects in relation to how the social security system can um, help uh, those uh, at risk of homelessness, uh, in homelessness and temporary accommodation. Uh, the committee has been asking questions about concerns in relation to uh, the cost of temporary accommodation. Not, and I'm resisting 
going on with the quality of temporary accommodation. Another committee might look at that in more detail. But it's not always satisfactory. But the cost of it that local authorities then, then organise, I think we, we got a, a, I know you can't see it in front of me, but it was a pretty eye watering cost in Edinburgh, certainly, for temporary accommodation, the use of B&Bs and the like. Uh, but certainly in my city, in Glasgow, and across Scotland, and you link into that the amount of housing benefit there is in the system that supports people in temporary, insecure, poor quality accommodation in a very unsatisfactory way and doesn't particularly uh, support a sustainable solution out or, or path out of homelessness. Um, so ideas on how the social security system can reduce some of those costs, because those in work and homeless often have to sofa circus because they're priced out of safety net temporary accommodation, but also how we can just use that money more effectively. And in doing and answering that, uh, if, uh, I don't know, I'm sure you are aware actually that um, the Scottish Government, uh, through the work of the Housing and Rough Sleeping Action Group, are trying to get a quantum around the amount of housing benefit currently in the system that's supporting those in temporary accommodation. Uh, I know COSLA are sympathetic to trying to capture that overall uh, pot of cash that's currently been funded to see, well, is there inflexibilities in the system? Does it just sustain a system that's actually failing a lot of homeless people in Scotland? And could that money be better used? And Cosler suggested that also perhaps the devolution of housing benefit and the use of that pot of cash much more than imaginatively to tackle homelessness and tackle issues with temporary accommodation would be a much more uh, progressive way forward and a better use of social security spending. So a lot in that, but I think it's important to put some of that on the record because we've got, we got a really interesting submission from COSLA in, in relation to that. I don't know, Ashley Campbell, if you want to, to, to go first on that. It's quite a complex question. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, there's recognition within the sector that the, the current structure of temporary accommodation and the way it's paid for was unsustainable, um, as you've pointed out. Um, some of the costs of temporary accommodation are extremely high. Um, there's work that's been done um, to try and recognise and capture what some of those costs are. And there are some genuinely higher costs um, for temporary accommodation in terms of staff costs, support costs, furnishing, um, void, turnover. Um, so there are additional costs um, associated with that. I think maybe the, the figure that you quoted um, in the, the SPICE um, briefing for Edinburgh was, was £1,900, which of course is extortionate and that's not sustainable for somebody who's in work, let alone for the, the social security system to sustain. So I think there is recognition that that needs to change. Um, you'll know that there are changes that are happening um, as a result of the, the HARSAG recommendations. So the Scottish Government and local authorities are looking at the use of temporary accommodation. They're looking at reducing the use of the temporary accommodation um, in terms of how the temporary accommodation is paid for through the social security system. I think that our concerns would be around making sure that the costs are realistic and um, that funding is based on need and entitlement. Um, you'll know that obviously that the UK government was looking at um, how temporary and supported accommodation is going to be funded in the future and there were suggestions around devolving a pot of money to pay for that. That would be a fixed amount and we were very concerned about that um, in terms of what would happen if need increased in the future. Would there be flexibility um, to be able to pay for that? Um, or would there be constraints around how much money there was? Um, and I, I don't know the details of COSLA's recommendation about um, devolving housing benefit and how flexible that would be, would that? Um, to be fair to COSLA, they, just, they drew it to their attention and said they supported the efforts of the, the group and the Scottish Government to get, get the quantum around that and to see how that money could be used more effectively and whether the, the devolution of it would be a more effective way of and realistic and practical way of, of taking that forward. I don't think beyond that they have a position. I wouldn't want to kind of uh, misrepresent COSLA, but I thought it was interesting that they are supportive of some of those moves. Yeah, I would certainly agree with the need to, to look at making the best use of what resources we have. Um, just to repeat, our concern would be um, how, the, how that amount of money was calculated, um, if it was going to be devolved, and how flexible that would be going forward, because we want to make sure that um, that's based on need and, and not a finite pot of money. Okay, that's very helpful. Beth, do you want to add anything? Um, the recommendation that you're talking about in terms of devolving um, housing benefit for temporary accommodation to Scotland was a recommendation of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group, which our chief executive chaired. So I think that's what, what COSLA are referring to. And there is work going on as part of the Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan work. Um, 
uh, I think that you've referred to, which is looking at what the costs of temporary accommodation are, are across different local authorities in Scotland and, and how we can best use that. Another recommendation within the HARSAG was that um, temporary accommodation um, rents in Scotland um, become much more aligned with LHA rates. Now, I think that's going to be very challenging for local authorities to achieve, um, and, and it will need considerable time to do that. But I think that would um, address some of the issues that, that Ashley referred to in terms of people coming out of temporary accommodation at, or, or, or people trying to work in temporary accommodation and, and it just being utterly unaffordable and unsustainable to work. I mean, in terms of the kind of wider issues about how we, we reduce temporary accommodation costs, that, that was a large part of the remit of the HASAG group. Um, and all local authorities now have to uh, have produced rapid rehousing transition plans, which will be about how, how they move to that. We would see the private rented sector as, as a really key opportunity within that, um, as long as it's affordable. So it, it would, we would then go back to our point about, you know, we need to, to make LHA rates affordable to make that a, a, a genuine route out of homelessness or to prevent homelessness in the first place. So if you can get a private rented tenancy in your local area, then, then that would be an ideal w w way of doing that if you aren't able to access social housing for example. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions from committee members before we draw to a close? Okay, uh, can I thank both our witnesses for uh, your evidence this morning? I'm sure you will do anyway, but we'd be keen for you to follow the, 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 the conclusion of the, the work of the committee. If there's any additional comments or evidence you want to give us in written forum, please, please do that. And uh, we appreciate your time this morning. Uh, can we suspend briefly before we move to our next panel? Uh, thank you. Okay, good morning everyone and, and welcome back. We're still on agenda item two, which is our, inquiry, our committee inquiry into social security support for housing. And we now welcome our second panel and I'm delighted the Department of Work and Pensions have got some witnesses here this morning. So can I thank Pete Serrell, Director of Working Age Policy, DWP, Richard D'Souza, Head of Universal Credit Engagement Division and Derek O'Day, Group Director Central and West of Scotland. Uh, uh, for joining us this morning. Thank you, gentlemen, for, for coming along and thank you for taking the time to sit through the last evidence session as well. That, that, was, that was appreciated. And we'll, we'll move straight to questions. Uh, the first one being from Alison Johnson, MSP. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning. Um, I'd just like to um, kick off with expanding on some of the evidence we heard in the earlier session. Um, you may be aware that Crisis and others have raised concerns with the operation of Universal Credit Scottish Choices. Um, its submission to the committee's call for evidence says that in some cases, even when someone is on fortnightly payments, their Universal Credit statement continues to record them as monthly and that this has caused anxiety and confusion for some people. I'm, I'm sure you'd appreciate that. So, um, 
obviously similar issues have been experienced with direct payments to landlords, which have been requested and granted, but haven't materialised for, for one reason or another. So I'd just like to understand if the DWP is aware of this issue um, and if you could just expand a bit on what might have gone wrong in that situation and what the solutions could be. I think we're aware in high level terms, and Richard may want to come in on some of the some of the detail, but um, constantly on those things. We don't always get it right. I mean, we try and get it right, but we do work very closely with, uh, with other people in the system, with local authorities, uh, with landlords, to try and make sure that the system works as well as it can do, um, where we are told about things that aren't quite working correctly, like that point about uh, the system still saying payments are monthly rather than fort, uh, fortnightly, mm -hmm. then uh, you will definitely try and progress those things and put them right. Um, uh, that, um, Richard, do you want to come on any further? I don't know much about the detail of it, but any, any information you can give us and then we'll take it away to fix it. I mean, it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Dirk knows any more. If, it, if it's a build feature in the system, then we need to go away and change the, the IT, but also we also make, need to make sure the guidance and the training we give to our people is, is right as well, and um, obviously mm -hmm. on the ground. So that's... So my understanding that it's in the build feature, which was then uh, laterally, it's a feature we're waiting to amend. So obviously, we'll, as part of that, we're upskilling our work coaches and giving them further information as to then pass on to claimants that this is the case, that uh, while it's saying that in the system, we will message them through their journal to say that this is the case. When we Just to clarify, when we say build, because there's a risk that we move into DWP jargon, when we say build feature, it means it's something that we've got to build into the, the system, and you'll appreciate there's a a queue of things to, to get into the system, so it's a question of prioritising those things, but trying to deal with them as effectively as possible uh, in the meantime, while we're trying to put them in. Um, I was pleased to learn about the, the work that Crisis have been able to do with five Edinburgh job centres, and obviously further afield in Coventry. Um, uh, and I'd just like to understand what training frontline staff have when it comes to you know, being aware of the housing situation facing some clients, how decisions such as sanctions uh, might impact on the clients, what the long-term impact of a decision that, that might be made could have. You know, um, I just want training frontline staff are given so that they understand how best to support clients. Derek, so, do you want to yeah, tell So, in terms of our frontline training, all our staff have had housing confident training throughout the whole year. So, we now have each member of staff in Scotland has went through housing confident. And last month, we uh, got the executive board to agree that we would redo the training. So we've got commitment that we will reevaluate what we did. We're currently setting that in motion and making sure that what we didn't do so well. Some of the really complex elements, we know that we get that through the complaints data, through, the, through other sources. That's the kind of information that we're going to use to, to roll out this year's training. Particularly in Scotland, what we're doing this year is we're, we're creating a strategy. This year in Scotland is all about the learning and development of our people. So every one of our people this year will go through an individual learning needs analysis. And as a part of that, these types of issues will be recorded and anybody that needs further training will be given it. We've created a culture in Scotland, actually, where we can now, people are putting their hands up and saying, we don't quite understand that. It's a complex piece and we're very happy to retrain people on that. So this is our whole year of learning and development in Scotland. Yeah, I mean, it is certainly a, a complex area uh, within which to work. Can I just ask, is there a requirement on staff implementing sanctions to consider the impact that that might have on the person? I mean, it, generally, yes, to look at the circumstances of that individual, the reasons why uh, perhaps they didn't comply, but also to take account of things like their, their housing situation. So that's part of what I think has been an excellent um, developing relationship with crisis around Edinburgh and other, other places such as Newcastle is helping uh, our people to really understand and get into the circumstances that individual claimants have. Sometimes, you know, without that understanding, if the relationship isn't quite right, they, they may not have things shared with them that otherwise they would. Once they know about those things, then you know, as I think some of the, the, the evidence um, that Beth gave earlier suggests, then that enables our work coaches to take account of those things and, and perhaps not give a sanction when, if they didn't know that, a sanction would be appropriate. So, so yes, that would be one of the factors. So one of the features that we've also done in terms of this sanctions this year, just to be really clear on this, sanctions is an absolute last resort. All our people in Scotland know that. They understand that. That's been widely communicated and we're leading that out to the extent that no sanction will be applied without a manager on site 
looking at that individually. So we've taken that action in Scotland to give us that managerial check before a sanction is applied. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Okay, can I just check on that? Because there will be a lot of public interest in relation to sanctions. Um, so can you give me some statistics in relation to sanctions, say, in, in, in the last year? How many, how many claimants have had their, their, their benefits sanctioned? I mean, what, what, what is the trend showing? What are the numbers showing? I don't have stats in front of me, I'm afraid, but I'm happy to share those uh, with you after the committee uh, in writing. Um, okay. I mean, that, that, that would be helpful. I, 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 I'm trying really hard to be respectful. My, my question wasn't going to be on sanctions, but I would have thought when the DWP comes to the Social Security Committee, you might anticipate at some point down the line you might be asked about sanctions and not to bring that information with you. Um, is unfortunate, particularly for Mr Kildee, who quite passionately made the case that sanctions are a last resort, but then you can't give me any numbers around sanctions at all. We're, we're better really, briefed on, on, housing, really well. on housing matters, because uh, that's what I thought the committee was about. It, but, it, yeah. Absolutely. We're going to come into rent arrears in a second as well. But I, I, I would have thought, given that Mr Kildee volunteered that information, you would then have had some figures to, to back up and substantiate that. But, um, yes, please, please, please give them to, to the committee. Um, so one of the issues in relation to housing is is the increase in rent arrears that, that, that on balance sheet uh, for uh, housing associations and for individual um, tenants uh, since uh, the rollout of universal credit going live. And I, I said in the last evening session that the four local authority areas who retain the vast majority of their own housing stock, East Lothian, Highland, uh, Eastern Bartonshire, Mid Lothian, who, who went live first, if you like, had a 26 percent increase in rent arrears on average and that came to about 5.7 million pounds uh, in, in that two-year period and that, that represented about 10 percent of the population of Scotland I think you have to take in River Clyde Homes to do that as well had a 35 percent increase in their rent arrears what would you put that down to uh, I mean, I'll hand over to Richard in a, in a second. I think, in broad terms, there's a lot, there's a lot behind rent arrears, and there's a lot of rent arrears um, that exist for, for people who aren't on benefit, universal credit, or housing benefit, or, or anything else. So it's a wider problem. Um, you know, what I think we did find, particularly in the early stages of, uh, of UC universal credit rollout, um, was that there were some issues that we found around implementation uh, that did lead to some difficulties. So. Um, we've done an awful lot to address those. So I think some of the issues um, and some of the, the stock of rent arrears that, that um, are reported that may be linked to universal credits are the result of the way the system was rather than the way the system is. So, you know, just to illustrate with two things, I mean, first, uh, advances. Um, now we've uh, really promoted advances. Uh, people can get 100% advance pretty well from the first day of a claim uh, of their full universal credit um, entitlement. And something like 60% of people are taking that up. Now, if you look back two or three years, it was a much, much smaller percentage, and it was only a 50% advance. So that sort of thing has really, uh, has really helped uh, to, to enable people to pay their rent up front. The second area that, that frankly, we did struggle with um, was for uh, uh, customers, claimants in social, uh, social um, sector accommodation, where we found that um, when we were trying to verify rent, what the, the, the tenant thought they were paying in rent was not what the landlord thought they were paying. So there was a real mismatch in information. It took us a long time to verify um, that information, which led to delays in payment. Um, so, you know, that caused problems. We brought in a landlord portal and built up the relationships with landlords around that, and I think Richard can say rather more about that. So I think there's a lot been done to improve the system. Right. Just before yeah. you want to talk about the landlord portal, uh, Mr De Souza, that, that would be very helpful, and that information was helpful as well. Given that the local authority areas that I mentioned were the, the, the first four or five, including Inverclyde, uh, to go universal credit full service rollout, um, and we have had a period of time now, um, are you able, have you looked at those figures to be able to tell us of that 26% increase in rent arrears? How much of that was a cyclical rent arrear? So it was part of the points that Al Alison Johnson was making about you're not really in rent arrears, it's just the way the payments are accounted for on the balance sheet. How much of that was uh, individual claimants having other living expenses because of a five, six, seven, eight, sometimes nine week delay back in the early days of universal credit rollout and how much of those rent arrears is caused by structural systems within universal credit because 
Um, you have came to this committee before as the Department of Work and Pensions and say what you do is you test a system, you improve it, you roll it out a bit more, you test it, you improve it and roll it out a bit more. So I assume you will be able to give the committee some more information in relation to detailed information in relation to level rent, rent arrears and the reasons for them in those four or five areas that were the first to roll out or go live in universal credit? Well, as I said, the, the rent arrears in those first four areas come from a whole broad range of different circumstances and the local authorities will be the ones who are best placed to understand what the sources of those rent arrears are. What I can say is that uh, we've we've learnt, we've addressed issues that we saw at working with those partners, those local authorities in the implementation of universal credit, and we've addressed those with a whole range of changes that we think, um, too early yet to get real strong evidence around it, we think is feeding through and improving things. Much of those arrears, to the extent they are universal credit related, would be sort of technical or book arrears, as the previous session brought out. But um, in terms of a brief detailed breakdown of the causes of those arrears, the local authorities, rather than me, would be best placed to, to answer that. So the DWP hasn't sought to analyse those, those numbers then? Well, we do. We do know that a lot of these, especially in the areas you mentioned, they arrived with pre existing rent arrears before they came onto universal credit. I and mean, over time, we do know that uni those, when they've been on universal credit for a period of time, the volume actually goes down. But those four that you mentioned, they actually came with a lot of pre-arrears from those early rollout sectors. Mm. And, and I think, I can yeah, yeah, Mr. 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 So, to get a, a, a proper handle on this, what you need to do is link data from the landlord with data from universal credit, so you can tell when somebody came onto universal credit, did the arrears arise at that point, whatever. So what we've done is we've um, been working with a housing association in the south of, southwest of England to, to perform that data match to see can we apportion uh, the, any growth in arrears between these different causes. And that does tend to show that initially people come with arrears. There's then a, a rise early on because in the past, if you were a local authority tenant, you got your housing benefit paid weekly and you got charged rent weekly. So once you're in the system, you couldn't get an effect on arrears. Now we pay you five weeks in arrears. You will get that money eventually, but there'll be a cash flow impact. So we noticed that as well. The, the, then, because we can recover arrears faster in universal credit than under housing benefit, the arrears then tend to stabilise and fall away. Now, we've only done that with one housing association. We're starting the process with two or three more. We also need to do it over a longer time so we can see, well, does this... Does this um, decline in arrears continue and then get us back to where we were at the start? So that analysis is going on, but it does require kind of rather close data sharing. So we have been able to do it with the local authorities you refer to, but that seems to be the profile of arrears and, and how it arises. The interesting thing is that it's largely this technical financial arrears or cash flow arrears. One of the concerns would have been, well, hold on, we used to pay all of our uh, landlords directly from local authorities under housing benefit, you're now going to give the money to the claimants. Isn't that going to put that at risk? What if they default? What if they don't, they don't pay? That noise hasn't, hasn't surfaced. And I think the reason it hasn't is because with the landlord portal, we also give landlords the opportunity, they've all taken it up, to be trusted partners. If you're a trusted partner and you want a direct payment made to the landlord, DWP doesn't interfere because you as the landlord are the best judge of that. Now, that stabilises around 30% of the, of the caseload being put onto direct payments. And that was the same in the pilots as it is in, uh, is in the national rollout. So it seems to me that that first line of defence against kind of real arrears, in inverted commas, is working quite, quite well. And what you're picking up there is the financial book arrears because you used to pay each other, you know, used to pay the same week that the rent arose. Now there is a five-week cash flow. Um, I mean, uh, first of all, can I thank for what I think was an offer in that reply to go back to East Lothian Council, Highland Council, Eastern Bartonshire Council and Mid Lothian Council and perhaps um, River Clyde Homes and do a proper data analysis of those arrears that have been reported to us through COSLA to better understand them because we have heard concerns about the five week wait minimum is causing significant issues for social landlords we have heard concerns that other debts that people accrue when that money then goes direct to individuals and families. They have to prioritise sometimes other, other items uh, to spend money on other than the rent 
because you have to go the immediacy of where if you have to feed your family or get clothes for the kids and that kind of thing. So we have heard all those concerns in, uh, from the, the, the social rented sector, including local authorities, and we have higher concerns in rent areas. So I would really appreciate a proper partnership analysis from those four local authorities in that housing association with, with the DWP. That would be incredibly helpful because what Mr D'Souza says is a little bit out of step with some of the information that we've had, but a partnership approach to getting beneath those figures would be very welcome. Well, this is something... Well, you can, but not before... But, well, I, to be fair, I don't need your help, Michelle Ballantyne, and I think mm. Mark... Uh, Griffin wants to explore that further. Mr Griffin. Yep. Th thanks, Kevin. I wanted to continue the line of question on um, direct payments. Um, I wanted to ask, first of all, what the administrative difference is for the DWP um, with direct payments in running an alternative payment arrangement and um, operating the Scottish Choices direct payment to landlord. What are the administrative differences in those two approaches? And I'll start, and colleagues may want to come in. So an alternative payment um, system you know, essentially is our way of trying to pick up vulnerability. Um, so, so up front, um, looking at a, at a claimant and trying to gauge whether whatever that claimant may want, uh, you know, actually is it in their best interests for the, the payment to be made direct to the landlord. So you know, cases where, where claimants might say, actually, I'd rather have the money myself, um, we might say, well, we think, frankly, you won't use it wisely and you won't pay your rent, so we're going to, to protect you, uh, we'll put a direct payment in place, which is part of that alternative payment arrangement. And that will be something, I mean, Derek can correct me if I'm wrong, but something that will be gauged by the work coach in that kind of initial conversation um, when they claim. Scottish Choices is, is giving people, um, giving uh, claimants that, that choice to themselves. Um, what we... Uh, the way the system should work is for us to assess the vulnerability first, so not to give uh, a straight choice necessarily to people who might not choose wisely, um, so to make sure we're picking up those vulnerable claimants first through the alternative payment arrangement system, and then to move on to Scottish choices to give that the claimant who may have chosen, who we may have decided could cope with uh, dealing with the rent themselves, actually, would you rather it was paid to the to the landlord direct? And that's that would happen from the second assessment period. Yeah, I'd just to follow on from what Pete's saying, this is absolutely to protect vulnerability. At the first point of the first point of interview, our work coaches are having that conversation, making a judgment call based on the information they have in front of them, the conversations they have to see if it would be better to put this person on this before we allowed them at the second assessment period to go into making a Scottish choice so that we'd be catching the vulnerabilities at the earliest point of contact. And just coming back to the convener's point, we are already working with those local authorities. That work is in train. Also, let's be put on the record that local authorities have tried to decipher where they, th they think those rent areas have accrued, uh, but what I was unclear about was whether or not there was that partnership work. So that gives me some form of reassurance, and that's helpful, Mr Kilday, for putting, putting that on the record. I understand the policy difference between alternative payment arrangements and Scottish choices, but what I wanted to understand was um, the administrative operation. What is the difference for a work coach um, sitting with a, a client? What is the difference in process between processing an alternative pay payment arrangement and processing um, a Scottish choice direct payment? In terms of actual detailed price, very little. Scottish choices was mirrored on what we're doing with alternative payment arrangement, but it happens further along the line. So the actual administration and the effect to the work coach conversation is no different, and it's no more administratively costly or either way. And it, it would feed, you know, so, so the work coach has the conversation and, uh, you know, passes on the information, then it would have to feed back to, to our service centres who will implement that on the system to make sure the arrangements get put in, and that would be the same you know, diff different flags or whatever on the system, but it would be the same for, a, for an alternative payment arrangement or for Scottish choices. Yeah. Yeah, so the process, the backroom process is the same. The, the training need, which, which as Derek talked about a lot, we've done a lot on Housing Confident, is how do you establish rapport with somebody so that you can identify that they are vulnerable and need, and need that um, direct payment or not. Okay. And that's where a lot of the, the, the extra wraparound training goes. Okay. That's, that's helpful to understand that... Uh, um, from one of the early evidence 
sessions, um, we heard evidence of a concern that clients were declaring vulnerabilities around about um, addiction or other things that but were being processed along a, a Scottish Choices option rather than an alternative um, payment arrangement. So I don't know if um, you want to look back at some of that early evidence and, and perhaps um, come back and, and write to, to address that. Um, but given that you've said that there is no administrative difference, can you say why um, an alternative payment arrangement applies from the very first payment of universal credit, but Scottish Choices direct payment only applies from second and subsequent payments? Again, Derek may want to um, sort of amplify or correct, but but essentially it's that it's that identifying vulnerability first. So you know if you if you if you ask them at the same time, then Scottish Choices should have, could effectively trump the the vulnerability question. And we want to make absolutely sure, most of all, is that someone who really needs, irrespective of what they want, but someone who really needs to be looked after and to have their money, their rent passed direct to the landlord, that that happens. So we need to get that right in the first assessment period. And it's only once that's sorted out that in the second assessment period we move on to Scottish Choices. It's simply that that ordering um, that leads to, to Scottish Choices being in the in the second assessment period. And I think on your on your point um, that you made, I think we, we are aware that it hasn't always been right in the in the past and it's something very much we're, we're actively looking at. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of your point of it not being right, we recently wrote out to all our work coach team leaders across Scotland reiterating the point, because we do know your point, uh, Mark, that that was what was happening. So we've reiterated that across Scotland recently. A Scottish housing leader put that memo out about a month ago, to, just to yeah. bring that back to our work coach notice. That's very helpful, because obviously with Scottish choices, um, for every choice the Scottish Government um, has a cost to pay for every transaction, um, as opposed to the DWP um, picking up the cost for alternative payment arrangements. So that guidance going out to, to work coaches, I think, is, is absolutely essential, and that's, that's good to hear. Um, the committee has been um, looking at the, the evidence that we've received and been considering um, whether the Scottish Choices, um, using the discretion the Scottish Government had, has to make payments um, direct to landlords as a default and given um, an option to, to tenants to take that choice to, to take it directly. I'm just wondering um, what the sort of DWP state of readiness would be if the Scottish Government were to pursue that policy option of um, automatic um, direct payments to landlords. Uh, I mean, it's something we'd, we'd have to to look at if they chose to do that, then we'd obviously very happily talk to them constructively to try and support them in implementing whatever policy they uh, they chose to follow. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that that we want, um, Scottish government want, National Northern Ireland want, Wales want to happen to the around the UC system. So we need to prioritise. That's why, for example, uh, uh, the changes around the removal of the spare room subsidy through UC. That's going to take a a while, it can't be done uh, sort of immediately, so we'd have to look very closely at whatever it was the Scottish Government chose to do and then to talk to them about what might be possible and when it might be possible and what the cost would be. Okay, thank you. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Camille, and good morning. Um, I suppose it's just really following up a wee bit uh, from the previous question. I mean, I'm still slightly unclear, um, and maybe this means that we've had a number of people give evidence to say that the first payment to the landlord doesn't go on time or doesn't go directly. And I think you've answered that slightly. But it, it does seem to me that this can then lead to issues around debt and around the trust between the landlord and the um, tenant. So is it now the situation that if I am on universal credit and get housing benefit, that that first payment will go directly? to the landlord, if I request that, as a first payment, would it always be the second payment? Uh, it, it should, it should. If if we put you on an automatic, uh, an alternative payment arrangement, it should be the, the first payment. Um, and it won't, it won't happen automatically. It's only if, if our work coach decide that that's the appropriate uh, way forward, that it should be a direct payment, then it should be the first, first payment. 
do we always get that right? Did we always get that right in the past? Um, you know, the honest answer is no. Are we doing much better now than we would have been a year or two years ago? You know, definitely. Um, but I certainly wouldn't suggest we always get it right now and we're looking to continuously improve. That's the sort of thing that Derek wrote out to colleagues about um, a month or so ago. Okay. Um, and the other issue that we, 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 we've had some issue around is, is, is in regard to this portal for landlords and the information that can be got there. Um, and I suppose is more work being done on that um, and what consultation is taking place, particularly with private landlords, to make sure that they can access that and have that information that they want and, and that you want and that, you know, so it's a joined up system. Richard. Okay, so, um, so the landlord portal is only available to social landlords because it allows access to people's data. And obviously social landlords are registered and regulated in a way that private landlords aren't. So there's a, there's a policy reason for not having private sector landlords on the, on the portal. What we're doing for them is to build an online system so that they can apply for a direct payment much more simply than they can at the moment. But the landlord portal itself is designed for social landlords. It was designed initially with one really important function, which was to verify housing costs so that people could be paid in the first assessment period. If you're on the portal now, you're in the mid-90% that, that people will be verified in the first assessment period. So it has done that job. It has got the potential to do much more, but we need to roll it out first so we, so we make sure that everyone's getting their, their housing costs paid in the first assessment period first. But it has the functionality to do more. And what we do is, with our regular engagement, quarterly basis, with Scottish landlords, with national landlords across GB, we invite them to say what are the things they would like to have next on the, the list so we can put them into the prioritisation. So it will, over time, grow and do more things. But to start with, we just want to get it to do its, its most fundamental purpose for everybody. Um, and we're not far off that. So within, I think by the end of May, we'll have invited every landlord, to a uh, social landlord, to be on the portal if they so wish. I suppose one of the issues for, for um, claimants um, has been that every two weeks, my understanding is that they have to get a fresh mandate. So if I've got a, a representative helping me, say from CAB or from some advice shop, um, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm wanting to engage with Universal Credit, with, with the DWP, um, I, if I want someone to do that on my behalf, I have to get a mandate set up every two weeks which seems to be quite cumbersome, or that person has to be there, and it seems to be quite difficult, particularly on the telephone, and some of the evidence we've taken around this is that it's becoming quite difficult to actually talk to the right person. And obviously, we move away from local authorities to a central system is part of that. Is there any way that this can be more streamlined for people who clearly need assistance in being able to ask the right questions? Should I pick that up? Yeah. 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 So I don't recognise the two weeks. Um, what I do recognise is a single issue. So be because, because we bring all the data from six benefit systems into one place, that's owned by the claimant. So it should be up to the claimant to decide who has access to that data. So you, you only have to apply for, uh, again, um, if the issue, once the issue's been resolved. So, so you're allowed to bring somebody in to, to have that conversation uh, on a particular issue. That seems to be sensible, not everything. If that um, issue isn't resolved within the first assessment period, I think you then have to ask again. But you can do that through the journal if you're online, you can do that over the phone, or you can go into a job centre and do that. So it should be pretty straightforward for somebody to be able to, to do that, but they have to do it on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. We haven't, can't give someone a portmanteau open house to talk about anything that you might have on your case. That seems to me to be an invasion of someone's personal uh, data. In the context of moving people across from the legacy systems, we're working very closely with stakeholders to see, well, how can we help people help other people more effectively? Because this is a bit of a bureaucratic uh, thing there, which, and we've got a lot of feedback with the workshops we've been having with stakeholders saying, we'd love to help people move from the legacy benefits eventually to UC and to be part of that conversation, but you're not helping us do that. So with Social Security Advisory Committee and ourselves and other stakeholders, we are looking at how we might kind of flex this in a more sort of productive and helpful way, particularly around that rather difficult move across. Okay, thank you. Um, my final question is, uh, clearly 
in, in any evidence sessions that we've taken, we always, you know, a bit like, people only come and tell us the negatives, we never hear the positives. Do you have statistics to say, you know, of the whole system in regards around this, around paying, paying money in regards to the landlord relationship, to the tenant relationship, do you have any figures to tell us how much is actually working well, you know, compared to those who are having problems? Uh, maybe a difficult question to answer, but for me, you know, obviously we hear lots of negativities because that's what people come and tell you. They never come and tell you we had a great experience. Are you, have you, are you collecting any data around how this is working as a whole so we can have a holistic approach to this? So certainly in Scotland, we can say that we look at this on a weekly if not, and monthly basis, and we know that there's a consistent trend in Scotland of being over 85% of people correct first time in the first assessment period. We strive for higher, but we have been consistently among the top three in the UK and Scotland for the past six months. So that's 85% for people who are on university credit about getting we'll be paid correctly we'll be on time. Paid on the on first, time. And that's 85%. First, okay. first assessment, first assessment period, period. Yeah. And, and it will be significantly higher in, in subsequent period. assessment yeah. periods. And that is, you know, in some ways you might ask, well, what about the other 15%? We always try and improve that, but a fair proportion of that other 15% uh, will be people who haven't provided the information we need to verify something or haven't, are not willing to sign a claim of commitment. So a range of reasons, we're trying to improve on that 85%. We've tracked that very closely. Um, it, it was a long way south of 85% a few months ago, which I think is part of that, well, a year or two ago, which is part of, I think, the, the kind of history of problems that, um, that people are rightly talking about. It's in a much, much better place now and has been consistently, consistently for the last few months. I, I mean, I wonder whether you could just provide that, maybe, information over the last two years so we can see the improvements taking place. Uh, that, you know, I appreciate you won't have that today, but okay. if you could provide that in writing forward, that would be helpful. Yeah. Certainly in terms of this, we, we, you, can, you can take it back two years, but we won't have UC in Scotland fully rolled out. We didn't roll out UC no. in Scotland until no. December. So each of the areas we've been working across in Scotland has increased and increased. And since the beginning of the term of this year, we've been hitting over 85% in Scotland consistently for, paid correctly in the first assessment period. There, there are, and there are published figures on this yeah. that we're obviously you, happy to, to, to share and signpost. Thank you, Camino. I think the committee would really appreciate that, and that's a positive thing for DWP to put on the record. When you're providing those figures, it'd be quite helpful to get what the story is with the other 15%, because it's part of that 15%. There may be some that are outliers that, that wait a significantly longer period of time. So maybe what the average delay is within that 15% as well would be quite helpful, just to better understand that. But it's, it's positive to hear there's a constant strive for improvement, but to better understand the full 100%, not just the 85%, would, would be welcome. Keith Brown to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward actually to um, First Minister's questions and general questions today, given what Jeremy Balfour said about people coming forward with what's working well and not just what's uh, not working well. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out in the Parliament. Um, on the issue of um, arrears, uh, we've heard a number of times in evidence that, of course, the cost of homes are or the cost of providing um, accommodation for people who are homeless or temporary accommodation is much more expensive. And sometimes that happens as a result of the arrears that have been built up for whatever reason. Uh, and sometimes it happens because the level of deduction from universal credit is so high that it forces people out of the accommodation that they currently have. I think it's 40%, uh, up to 40% of somebody's unit, which may be £317 a month for a single person over the age of 25. So 40% of that gets deducted. It's much harder to sustain a tenancy in that circumstance. Have you any views on the level of deduction? I know it's an active dis uh, discussion just now with um, the um, Committee on Working Pensions at Westminster on what a more sustainable level of deductions would be. And by sustainable, I mean one which would not force people out into um, other forms of accommodation. Do you have any views on that? Uh, well, as you say, it is a maximum of 40%. And it's 40%, just to be clear, of the, the standard allowance, so not the full universal credit entitlement, including housing and, and various other things, but just the, the standard allowance. That is a maximum, so lots of other people, lots of people will be paying back less than that. Um, you know, on reflection, the department, um, current Secretary of State has thought that that's a bit too high, so we have plans to bring that back down to a, a maximum of 30%. 
Uh, I think from next year, I don't have the precise date in front of me, I don't know whether Richard knows. So I think from some point next year, we'll bring that down to 30%. Um, there's, there's always a balance here though. So, so part of those deductions are to help people uh, keep their electricity flowing, uh, keep their, their water flowing, so to make sure that they are paying back at a rate that they can agree with, um, with utility providers and with their landlords for arrears, so to keep them in stable circumstances. So it's a balance between making sure that they're paying those things off in a way that works for, for those organisations, keeps their relationship with them stable, but not take so much that it puts them in, in real hardship. And you know, we're always happy to keep looking at, at that balance, both at the individual level and at the, the macro level, but the, the plan is already to bring that maximum down to 30% from, from next year, I think. And my thoughts are mentioning that the, um, for advances, the 12-month the period, re repayment period, is going to then go up to 16 months. So the Secretary of State announced that as well. So it's not just the rate, it's also the, the term, as it were, that matters. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. That, I mean, those deductions can be for all sorts of reasons and not just for rent arrears, as you mentioned. And I would want to make it clear, these deductions are perfectly legitimate. People need to be paid for money that's owed. I understand that point. But even if the 30% reduction is what happens, I think the Working Pensions Committee recommended 5%, um, which is a big difference. It's six times, obviously, the amount. I just wonder whether the DWP has any ability to interrogate the data to the extent they could say... If this is causing, if the level of deductions is causing people to leave the tenancies that they're currently in and then have to be accommodated in another way, that's obviously a pretty big cost to the taxpayer. And if it is the case that the Secretary of State goes for the 30% level, is it possible to work out the cost of doing that as opposed to the cost of reducing it to 5%? Obviously, part of the cost is that people that are owed money will get paid less um, over time, but the cost to the taxpayer, is there any way to work out that figure uh, with the systems that you, you have? The cost that's been incurred by people being forced out of tenancies that might otherwise not be if the deductions were less? Uh, I suspect it's very, very difficult to work that out, partly because you know, if someone leaves a tenancy, there, there are usually a number of reasons why they left a the tenancy and you know, the extent to which the level of their deductions being 30% rather than 5%, it's going to be very, very difficult probably impossible, I would say, to, to separate that out. Um, the, the, I, mean, I, I think, and Derek may know better than me, but I, I think that uh, you know, we would always look to, to, to say, well, that's the maximum, but actually, in your personal circumstances, what is the appropriate amount? How much can you afford to pay back? Um, I would say that um, if you bring it down to 5% as a maximum, um, so a lot of people probably are only paying 5% now, if you bring it down to 5% as a maximum, then there's a real risk that that would create uh, additional concern amongst landlords, uh, additional problems with utility companies, and actually would cause more problems um, than it would solve. Um, but that's something that we can explore with uh, Work and Pensions Select Committee further. But as I say, it's very much a balance to get the, you know, the, the, the payments made, keep people in stable position, but also in a position where they can afford to, uh, to feed themselves and pay their rent. My last question for you. I think that last point is interesting. So you might find a sustainable position where people can pay the deductions back and sustain a tenancy, but I think the Department of Working Pensions or rather the Working Pensions Committee found that would be, often be at the expense of any discretionary spend, if you can call it that, for things like food, um, given how little slack there is in terms of the amount that's paid in any event. But I suppose you, the last point I would ask is that if it's not possible to interrogate the data to find out whether a change such as that would be beneficial to the taxpayer, and by which I mean 5% or 10% as opposed to 30%, which I think is quite a big issue, and I would imagine there's a big amount of money at the end of that, I don't know, of course, but if it's not possible to do that, that suggests to me a kind of limitation on the systems which are being used. And if we just go back to a point I think this committee heard before, that some of the legacy systems in the DWP for universal credit um, included a paper-based system in a basement somewhere dating from 1948. Now, I don't know whether any of the legacy systems that you're having to work with in relation to the housing element of universal credit are like that. I suppose my question is, given that it doesn't seem possible to work out the opportunity cost of having deductions at 30%, are you happy with all the systems 
that you have are providing the best possible information for ministers to take decisions on, if I can put it that way. Uh, am I happy that all our systems provide the best that would know? Um, you know, in part, that's, that's why we're bringing in universal credit and bringing in a, you know, a, a, the universal credit full service, a very digital uh, system that will give us all of that. We're, we're building it. It's not fully there yet, but we're building that. So, um, you know, we will be in a much, much better place in two, three, four years' time um, than we, we are today or were, you know, a year or two ago. Um, you know, some of our systems... I think the carers allowance system and carers allowance is being uh, uh, devolved, but you know that that dates back to the 1970s, and I, I didn't even realise that computer systems really existed in the 1970s. But we've still got one or two uh, just about working, um, so they are um, very clunky. I mean, I think on you know going back to the inference you drew about the the, the five percent, thirty percent issue. You know, I think we can get data on who's paying 5%, who's paying 30% um, for what. You know, that sort of data we can get. We can analyse that and we can provide advice on the back of that. Data simply doesn't exist anywhere and couldn't exist, however good our systems were, about the behavioural consequences of, of that because there's so much else going on. You know, that's, that's just the complexity of the world and no administrative system could ever... Uh, take all of that into account. We can try and make judgments about it, but it's not a system issue. Thank you. Good morning. Um, interesting, your last point about how, how do you figure out what people are doing and how they're behaving, and, and it is indeed extremely complex. Um, and you know, going back to earlier, I have been gathering a lot of data, looking at some of this and what are the impact on rent arrears, etc., and subject to what you were asking earlier, um, I have some figures from some of the areas that I've brought with me today. Um, East Lothian, you, you mentioned, 75% of tenants had rent arrears prior to claiming UC. Um, the average debt owed by UC claimant now has gone down from £1,022 down to £786 um, since the rollout. So, and, and that is repeated in, in all the different councils that have come back to me with all the data. So, and on average, the increase seems to be where it has gone up initially. Um, it's gone up around between 1% and 2% of, of total debt owed. Do those figures reflect your experience on the ground with your claimants? Um, because the, the message I'm getting back from a lot of councils is that it does go up initially, and then it seems to come sort of gradually down. So those who have been on it longest um, are seen, seeing that trend. And I've got a few here. I've got Sterling, Clack Manager, West Lothian, East Lothian, um, and they're all reflecting similar, similar patterns. Absolutely. It was Richard's point earlier on. That, that is absolutely the profile that we expected to see, mm -hmm. and it is now playing out as universal credit is becoming more mature as we move through. So thank you for sharing those. And I, I, I stress again, you know, in addition to that, some of those figures will flow from you know, points of time a year or two years ago. Mm -hmm. And we've done a number of things since then that should um, mean that less arrears are likely to build up in the short, in the short term. So actually the initial sort of rise should be rather less. So things like the 100% advances um, mm -hmm. from originally 50%, mm -hmm. things like the two-week housing benefit run-on. So that's essentially two weeks of, of free housing benefit in parallel to universal credit entitlement um, that people can, can use to prevent arrears. So a number of things we've done should actually mean that for the future, um, it's, it's, it's less uh, problematic than even that. And I think, you know, for me, what, what, where I'm really concerned is obviously there is a, a high level of structural debt in many of our um, benefit claimants that, that go back you know, looking at some of the figures, um, where they've, literally some of them have sent me a series of date month on month going right back way before um, universal credit was introduced. Um, and I think it's some of those behaviours and I think some of the evidence from crisis is where we need to be looking at, at what happens to people, how their behaviours affect, relationship breakdowns, etc. Um, and I think when it comes to housing and, and the delivery of benefits, I'm very interested in that sort of wider support that sits around individuals and how they get that and I wonder if you could just um, touch again on, on the kind of things that you feel you can do you know as a DWP in the job centres to actually support some of that when you're meeting because you have the opportunity 
obviously when people are coming to claim benefits and, and talking to you or, or communicating with you. Um, and I do think it's, it's extremely important how people are treated during that period and the support they get. Um, so if you could just elaborate a little bit on that, it would be helpful. So, just actually to, to back up part of what you were, you were mm -hmm. saying there, just for completeness in the COSLA mm -hmm. yeah. submission in relation to structural debt or debt that uh, claimants have before they move on to universal credit. COSLA say, while we would accept these points, they do, they do accept mm -hmm. those points. The data we have gathered generally shows sharp increases in the levels of rent areas once local authority areas go into full service. Feedback from our, feedback from our members supports the view that the way universal credit is structured exacerbates the problems for both for landlords and for tenants. So mm -hmm. it's one of those things where we absolutely have to accept that point, but there may still be structural issues there. So it's important that you put that on the record. Uh, Michelle, Derek, I think you were going to reply Yeah, I think to in that. terms of that, the removal of the seven-day waiting period will be a big factor. Mm -hmm. We expect to see a big difference where we get in that peak at the moment. I think mm -hmm. once that, the seven-day waiting period settles, that's when I think we'll see that it should smooth that part out a wee bit. So in terms of the, the bigger, wider engagement, we do a lot of area and partnership level team. And Homeless Action Scotland director meets with us regularly. Uh, we also chair the quarterly roundtable. Uh, and we, we walk the customer journey with, with all the partners of that to try and understand what can we do better. We've got an awful lot of work going on in, in terms of that, uh, not just at a uh, director level. That filters all the way down. Each of our job centre team leaders and managers have developed really good relationships. And we, we're often asked to, to come and, and, and be part of these uh, interventions that we're talking about and walk the customer journey. One of the ones that's really interesting, in the last few weeks, we've been working with uh, uh, Glasgow and looking at what we, what we do with shelter and other homeless organisations to try and understand better how do we get to that position that we can totally understand the journey. So we worked with the Simon community in Glasgow recently and a number of our senior managers went on the streets and walked with the shelter members and really to try and understand homelessness and all, this, all of its aspects in that. So we're setting up a meeting with them and in the next couple of weeks to try and have an understanding and see, so what can we do? What can we look at the way that our policies and structures are built to try and unlock some of the things that's causing difficulties for people that are working in this arena? So we're, we're stepping into that arena and trying to develop deeper and wider partnerships in, in all I, aspects. I certainly think it's in incredibly important that, that all individuals feel confident to come and speak to somebody before they get into difficulty. Um, and it feels to me that's one of the things that has been troublesome in the system. Um, and some of the messaging has been very much about you know, putting people off, coming and seeking help. And the earlier people seek help, the more chance they have of not getting into difficulty. Um, so I would very much like to see um, a really positive messaging going out that actually encourages and makes people feel confident to come and get help early on, even if they're just worried, yeah. before it gets to any stage of actually being a difficulty. And that relationship with the work coach is absolutely crucial, and mm. I'm constantly um, uh, impressed when I go to, to job centres with mm. the commitment of work coaches, and I think many of the members have been to job centres, mm. you know, really committed staff, care deeply about the, the claimants and the customers, and are really focused on building those partnerships with a full range of organisations locally. But that's also very much uh, a strong focus for the department from ministers, permanent secretary down um, uh, over the last sort of year or so, is to really build focus on those external partnerships so we can work together with other organisations for the benefit of, of the customer. So a very strong focus from top to bottom of, of the department. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from members? Can I maybe just mop up one or, one or two things there? Um, then one of the things that was raised uh, by COSLA was uh, in, in relation to their desire to see the automating the notification of annual rent increases from, from councils uh, to the D Department of Work and Pensions for Universal Credit and removing the current requirement for claimants to notify DWP of their rent increase within the relevant assessment period. They said this would protect rental payments for claimants and landlords alike. At the moment, there's a individual, uh, on, the onus is on the individual to notify um, the WP of that. Surely there must be a more um, logical way of taking that forward that, that makes it easier actually for the DWP but actually protects the tenant and, and the landlord. Any thoughts around that? Yeah, so this, this year for the first time we've tried to use the landlord portal to do some of this 
process, and, and so to make that much more automated. Um, but it's our first go, and, and you know, as credit is one of those things where you do iterate and try and learn and improve. So, you know, year on year. But we've done this exercise in collaboration with a selection of social landlords. So, you know, absolutely up for that, and that's that's really where we're we're heading anyway. Okay, that, that that's helpful. And any update when you think we could we could we we could get get that because there's a direction of travel. So I guess what you're saying, Mr. Tussa, you would like to see that happen, but it's not as simple as saying let's just do it. Well, we're partially doing it this year um, towards the end of May, I think, is the, is the date, which will be then using the portal to upload data with the rent changes so that individuals won't then have to go on and do it all themselves and then be verified by the landlord, which will be a really you know, laborious process and, and not efficient at all. So that is happening this year for the first time. It's not the full-blown automated solution. It's the first step towards that. But you know, it just shows you the sort of functionality that the, the portal will allow us to to deploy as we as we improve it and well, add to it. And if that testing is successful, then that would be rolled out more widely. And yeah, that, but and that we would want happen. to check it with landlords that it's worked for them as well. Mm. Um, so we'll review it and then see how we can make it better next year. OK, uh, you also probably heard in the, the last session um, where COSLA had told us in the written submission that local authorities uh, are not advised by WP of tenants or claim or claimants whose payments have been reduced by the application of either the bedroom tax or the benefit cap in universal credit cases and can only provide such support when claimants come forward, even when that support might be on offer. And COSLA previously really, uh, raised the issue of that communication between local authorities and landlords and the DWP to make sure that they can step in as quickly and effectively as possible to offer a degree of support, and that's not necessarily happening at the moment, so they're continuing to make representations to, to yourselves. Where are we with that? Is that something you're minded to, to move on? Well, we're, so we're working closely with Scottish Government colleagues to see how we can transfer information to them, to local authorities, so they can operate that more efficiently. So work is in, is in hand. We haven't yet got a completed model for how that's going to happen, but, but it's kind of a, the, this sort of, you know, been discussing this for quite a while, so how best we can get the information that's needed across. Um, so until we do the automated solution for the spare room subsidy, we're doing all we can to help with a tactical solution. Okay, but those discussions are going on. But ultimately, I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately oversimplifying it for the purpose of, of, of the evidence session. It, should this become possible, well, there's no reason why you would not want to do this. You want to do this. You're trying to find a way to make sure it can happen. Absolutely. Right. OK. That's quite helpful. I suppose the final question, um, me and look at my other members if they want to come in. There's a little bit of time to do so, but my, I suppose my final question would be um, ideas and suggestions that the DWP has to... To, to how the, the, the social security system can better protect those at a risk of homelessness or are trapped within the homelessness system, be it in temporary accommodation, uh, be, it, be it in hostels. You'll have heard us put on record some of the costs in relation to that temporary accommodation, the role that housing benefit pay plays within that, and initiatives from DWP and the UK government to try and capture some of the cash around that to do more in that area, and at the same time, the Scottish Government's efforts to kind of get a quantum around the amount of housing benefit in the system to see if there's a, a better way of using that. We had some concerns in relation to that not compromising the in, uh, an individual needs assessment and entitlement of claimants, but there must surely be a better way of using money that's in the system. And you know, politicians are good at making suggestions. What would the suggestions be of the DWP to, to do some of that around homelessness? I think generally, you know, carry on the, the hard and good work we're doing around universal credit. So the rollout, but also recognising that everything's not perfect and, and keep trying to make it work even better to address any, any concerns and you know, things like the landlord portal. I think the things that we've heard um, that are more kind of on the ground, really close working awareness amongst our, our work coaches and close working with crisis shelter and a whole range of other organisations, that's really important. In terms of temporary accommodation and the cost there, uh, I mean, w we wouldn't support uh, devolving those costs, but absolutely um, we would be keen to explore further with a full range of stakeholders and other interests what could be done to, to operate more cost effectively and to get better outcomes from that system because it's not self-evident to me why some of the rents and temporary accommodation, you know, particularly where it's social sector accommodation, uh, why they should be so high. Um, so absolutely up for exploring with others 
what we could do to, to get better outcomes for the money that is spent on temporary accommodation through housing benefit and okay. uses. So open-minded, I know a lot of these things become uh, politician-led, so, you know, Secretary of State-led and, and Scottish Government-led and, and, and all those kind of things, but DWP on the ground, you've got direct experience of how that money is or isn't used uh, well, so it's important that the DWP has its own unique voice in relation to that, out, out with the... The, the, the politicians that I understand that you're accountable towards, but just trying to make some space for that within my line of questioning. Um, the Clarkin team's reminded me we haven't really interrogated some aspects of the local housing allowance, which we really, really should do. So let, let's put some of that on the record before we uh, draw this evidence session uh, to an end. C can I ask, uh, how does the Department of Work and Pensions intend to upgrade the local housing allowance rates after the freeze ends in 2020, would you agree with evidence that the freeze has resulted in the LHA no longer meeting the, the policy objective of covering the lowest 30% of the rental market? And if so, what exactly is the policy objective of uh, LHA? You've heard part of that in the previous evidence session, I know. So what does the future hold uh, from 2020 onwards? I mean, the, the policy objective of the LHA isn't to meet 30th percentile of the market. That was where it was set, um, you know, back in 2010. But that's not the policy. That was the, just the parameter at that time. The policy objective is to make a, a substantial uh, um, contribution to help people to meet their private rented sector housing costs, um, taking account of the needs of, of that family, the, the local rental market, but also the needs of the taxpayer uh, and fairness with with other renters. So that's the broad policy. Um, you know, absolutely, um, it's been frozen as as uh, earlier evidence givers said. It's been frozen since 2016. Well, the rates have all been frozen since 2016, uh, and were uprated in relatively low uh, terms by CPI uh, in the in the years before that. So in many areas, they have fallen significantly below. Uh, that 30th percentile uh, point. Um, what we're going to do from next year, um, we haven't decided yet, the government hasn't decided yet, um, but our Secretary of State is very much on record uh, as having said this is something that she will be um, talking uh, to the Chancellor about as part of the spending review discussions um, that we expect to happen over the, the next few months uh, uh, to see what we can do to, to, to change local housing allowance rates uh, from April next year. So no uh, no announcements from me. You won't be surprised to hear today, but definitely plans to look very hard at this uh, and talk very hard with the Treasury and the Chancellor um, over the coming months. But you would have concerns, I assume, then, that some of the local housing allowances don't even provide enough money to reach that 30th uh, percentile. So that would be of concern to you, and you're raising those concerns uh, with government. There's, there's no particular magic about the 30th percentile. I mean, I think it's something like 25% of, uh, of the private rented sector in Scotland is on housing benefits. So the 30th percentile isn't a magical point. It was 50% before that, 30%. Um, am I concerned um, that some people, uh, the amount that will pay through the LHA is, is very well below that 30th percentile point, that there is a very small proportion of the market that is affordable to them? That is the sort of um, you know, analysis and evidence that we will feed into the Treasury uh, when we talk to them to try and um, you know, get a, uh, an agreement through the spending review for, for next year and beyond. Can I thank you for that answer, Mr Serrell? That's as close as I think I'm going to get you to say that you have got concerns in that, but I take on board the point you're making. Um, can I ask what assessment the DWP has made of the impact of reducing the shared room rate to under... Uh, um, 35s, would you agree that much of the evidence the committee has heard and that a particular problem for young people finding affordable accommodation, um, particularly their lower benefit rates that they get and, and lower earnings on occasions as well, are there any plans to review, that you're aware of, to review the age to what the shared room rate applies or to extend exemptions? And again, we heard some of that this morning in the earlier evidence session. So any comments or information you could give the committee on that? Uh, no, no plans. I mean, in terms of Comments. I mean, again, I think we'd um, we'd feed that um, into our broader look at the local housing allowance rates that we'll be discussing with Treasury um, ahead of, of next year. Um, but we are in constant communication with you know Crisis and a whole range of other organisations about 
you know, various different strains and stresses in the system, um, what the exemptions might be. Uh, you know, we, we hear loud and clear that concern, particularly around the, the move up from 25 to 35. So we're aware of it. Um, you know, it will feature in our discussions with the Treasury. Beyond that, I, I couldn't comment. Okay. Uh, but that, that, I guess that, that's the closest we're getting. I see Alison Johnson has been able to come back. And Alison was, 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 was highlighting this next question, I think, in the earlier evidence session. The committee heard evidence that the broad rental market areas are too wide to reflect wide variations in rents in some areas, for example, in Edinburgh. Is there a case for reviewing the broad rental market areas? Uh, you know, there, there are always different systems one could look at. Um, uh, we don't have any plans to review the broad rental market areas. Um, again, as previous witnesses have said, they've been in place for, for a long time. Um, you know, actually, if you did change the broad rental market areas, you'd suddenly find that, you know, you'd have some winners as well as, but you'd also have significant losers. So any major reform has quite a big impact on the system. Uh, I'm not sure it would uh, really address the sort of issues that, um, that we're concerned about. You'd also... Um, you know, find that if you went down to a much narrower area, then the problems that um, that were highlighted earlier on about you know having very small numbers of rents to look at to judge um, what the right local housing allowance should be in an area, you'd end up with you know one or two or three, which which really wouldn't be um, uh, productive. So, no plans to to look at that um, in in the future. Okay. Um that's, that, that might not be what everyone wants to hear, but it's very helpful that you put that on the record. And I'm minded that you do plan to raise the 30 percentile issue with the UK government and that you will discuss again the under 35s shared room issues with the UK government, but not the broad rental market area. So here's hoping those first two matters that you will be discussing with with, with government means there may be some movement there, but uh, thank you for putting that on the record. Before we close this evidence session, is there anything that, that our, our witnesses want, want, want to put on the record before, before we close? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, as always, thank you very much for coming along supporting the work of the Social Security Committee. We, we very much appreciate it. That ends Agenda Item 2. Uh, we now move to Agenda Item 3, but we'll suspend briefly before we do that. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, welcome back, everyone. We now move to agenda item three, which is a, an item uh, on pension credit. Can I refer members to paper four? Note by the clerk and correspondence from the UK government, Scottish government, and Citizens Advice Scotland. At our meeting on the 7th of March 2019, the committee received evidence from Citizens Advice Scotland and Age Scotland in the forthcoming changes to eligibility for pension credit. The changes are due to take effect from the 15th of May. 2019, Citizens Advice has provided supplementary information to the committee. Following uh, this meeting, the committee agreed to write to both the Scottish Government and UK Government, and responses have now been received, which have been circulated. Uh, and I'm only going to ask for the committee's comments in relation to, to, um, to, to those replies. I may just put on the record some of my thoughts in relation to it at the moment. Um, I do remain dissatisfied, I think, with, with the UK government position, not only on the policy which the Scottish government and their reply to us estimate will impact on 3,800 mixed pensioner households by the year 2021-2022, 20, 
uh, to the tune of around £20.8 million. Pounds. But also the rationale for implementing the policy is estimated that could impact households for up to £7,000 each. The income guarantee for pension credit is £12,940, but for universal credit it's £5,990. I think most people can see uh, there's quite a stark uh, difference there. And the Scottish Government in their reply noted this may also impact some WASPy women also, in relation to the policy intent, Guy Opperman, MP Minister for Pensions, and I thank Guy for, for replying to us, said it is important to be clear that this is about making sure that all working age people, irrespective of their partner's age, are subject to the same labour market approach and that taxpayer support is directed to where it is needed most. That, that's the policy intent and, and, and that is, is a reserved issue. But I, mean, I do find it fanciful that, um, that what we're actually doing is we're treating various pensioner households differently. So the policy intent to keep working households the same actually gives a variation in how we are treating pensioner households and to the significant detriment of many pensioner households. So that would be my thoughts in relation to the reality of what the policy intent wishes to achieve. We also specifically asked the UK government about conditionality and sanctions that might apply to households where there's a pensioner and a non-pensioner non in the same household claiming universal credits, um, and whether or not uh, they may be subject to conditionality or sanction. In the reply we got, pensioners and mixed-age couples claiming universal credit will not be subject to any work-related conditionality rules. Uh, however, conditionality for the working age partner will be tailored to meet their specific circumstances just as it would be for any other claimant. So I suppose I do have a concern there could be a double detriment to some of these households where they could be losing up to £7,000 uh, a year, but the working age individual who may have responsibilities in that household could also find themselves in theory, and admit it as in theory, subject to conditionality which could lead to sanction. And this committee has spoken quite a lot about particularly in our last inquiry in relation to those that are moving from the tax credit system over to universal credit and whether conditionality or sanction should apply to those. The majority of the committee thought that that would not be an appropriate thing to do. I accept that we're not going to change the policy position of the UK government on this, even though the majority of the committee may, may disagree with the UK government's policy position. But I do wonder if there's scope as a committee uh, to come together and go back to the UK government and say, well, we're disappointed that, that they are restating that policy position that we would ask that they, they again they review the conditionality arrangements for uh, mixed pensioner households, just to reassure ourselves that those households don't get a double detriment by the, the reforms that have been brought in on the 15th of May. So that, that's my personal view. I wanted to set it out, and it's only appropriate that we have a discussion as a committee based on all the replies that, that we have received. So are there any, any comments in relation to the replies we have received or, or, or any thoughts? Michelle. I think rules should be consistent. Uh, I've always felt that, whatever you're talking about. So I think if you're of working age, your rules should be consistent. You shouldn't be you know, subject to a different set of rules because your partner happens to be older. You know, it, that's my position. OK, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. you, should, you, you, should, you should put on the record. Thank, yes. Thanks for that, Michelle. Uh, Keith? Um, <clears throat> my view is I agree with the point you made, convener, but I'd go a bit further. The point I raised during the uh, pre-meeting discussion was about potential moves to go further than this, because the um, Minister for Pensions and Financial Inclusion says at the end of his letter he's talking about Apparently, this is action that helps to alleviate levels of pensioner poverty, and he mentions a triple lock. Now, what I'd asked before was about reports that the triple lock was now under threat, and it actually comes from a committee of peers, including somebody who rejoices in the name of Lord True, a Tory peer, which is talking about taking away free pensioner bus travel, which could only apply to England and Wales, presumably, winter fuel allowances, and reopening the triple lock, as well as TV licences being paid for by over 75s. It seems to me now that is as yet only the recommendation of this committee, but that's often where these things start off. There's also David Willits, Lord Willits of Two Brains, presumably, 
um, who has also made a similar recommendation. So my worry is that despite the fact that the Minister is saying they remain committed to the triple lock, we will start to see a much more broad-based attack on pensioners. And the rationale that's given for it in these reports is that it's unfair. It's about intergener intergenerational fairness, basically saying pensioners are too well off compared to young people, which I think is a false dichotomy. So I think what I would like to see convene out is, I know it's probably a complete um, waste of time because the UK government doesn't see fit to come to these committees anymore, but to ask the minister to come to explain, to confirm, to reassure that the triple lock and these other potential attacks on pensioners form no part of UK government policy. That is fundamental to the social security of pensioners in Scotland. And I think this committee should be interested in it. Okay, can I just, uh, Mark, I'll take you in a second, just for clarity then, whatever we do correspond back to the UK Government Minister uh, for, for pensions, your suggestion is part of that correspondence, we should invite them to committee to address some of these concerns. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank to, to come to address to, those, to your committee the committee to, to address the those concerns. Yeah, Mark. Thank, thanks, Kavina. I think the, the reply is, is very disappointing, to say the least. I think the priority of the UK government should be addressed. The scandalously low uptake of pension credit at 40 per cent. There are 60 per cent of um, pensioners in the UK living in poverty because they are not uptaking their right um, to, to pension credit, which is one of the, the key drivers of lifting um, pensioners out of poverty over the last um, 20 years. That should be the government's um, priority. But I think if we're talking about um, actions off the back of this disappointing response, I would agree with um, a request to the Minister to come and speak to us and also um, at the very least to keep a track of the, the, the impact of the number of pensioners that this um, policy pushes into to poverty. Um, the, the, the policy objective of universal credit is um, to encourage people to seek um, more hours or better paying work um, to, to increase their household income. What this policy is asking um, a household to do is to ask one household member to increase the, the value of their work or the number of hours they undertake to, um, to cover for two people's incomes. Um, I don't know how many extra hours that is going to take a working age person to have to undertake. I mean, how many hours in a week does the UK government expect someone to work to support their um, pension age um, partner because of this decision. Um, I would support any um, measure of getting the, the Minister here to answer some of those questions. Mm. Okay, any other comments on that? Jeremy, would you like to come in? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that I found disappointment probably in regard to both letters is that we've still got the 60% of people who are not taking up this benefit mm. who will come the 15th of May if you can get on before 15 minutes, we'll get the benefit. And I think there's a lack of awareness, you know, when you talk to people about this happening. And I do wonder whether we should go back to both governments. We clearly haven't got very long, but I do think there needs to be something out there within, you know, the media, within some kind of telling people that this is happening. Whatever your view of it right or wrong, only 40% of people are taking it up. We have, you know, the overwhelming majority are not. Um, and not, neither government, I mean, I appreciate it's got to go and do my financial health check, but actually letting people know that this is happening does seem to be an issue that no one's really grasped. You know, and with so much else going on in society, media, politics, this is just not being talked about. And I don't know if there's any way as we as a social security committee can do something with a press release, something just to say, this is happening on the 15th of May, you've only got, what is it, 19 days left, whatever, to do something about it. Uh, in regard to your first decision, I mean, I think I am also, I mean, I think, you know, why are we making a differential just because of someone's age? I mean, I think that's not right. So I wouldn't support the thing that you would put into your letter. But I do think there's a bigger, broader issue here. We've only got a couple of weeks left before this happens. Can we, as a committee, put something out onto social media, onto the general media, just to say this is happening. Okay, so 
let, let's focus first of all on where there is agreement. I think we can agree we, we should seek, seek, seek to publicise the issue that people will lose out if they don't claim before the 15th of May. So I think as, as, as the convener, we can, I can make sure that, that we, do, we do that and whatever correspondence, whether by majority, majority or unanimously, whatever correspondence we put to both Scottish and UK governments, we'll make sure that that, that, that is stressed within that as well. Can I push me a little bit further on that, Mr Balfour? I'm just wondering if there, if there are people out there who clearly after the 15th of May had that underlying entitlement, because 60% of people who have that entitlement now are not claiming it. There's no reason why the UK government could, if someone claims after the 15th of May, uh, but had that under, underlying entitlement before the 15th of May, they, they couldn't uh, exceed to giving them uh, their pension credit cover. Do you think that would be a reasonable thing to do? And I, and I suppose the issue of that is you've got to draw a line somewhere. And, and I think there's been a failure on, frankly, both governments, and, and this is all to do with so many other things going on in politics, but this just hasn't been got out. So I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I'm saying we should be on it. I just think we as a committee have raised this as an issue. We have a, a number of days left before it comes into place. Let's at least unite around one issue that we can tell people, and whether that's through the Scottish Parliament website, whether that's through some kind of press release to, to the general media, whatever, th that's what I'm suggesting. So, so that bit, I mean, so, so I don't have your support for the, se the, second, the second aspect of that, but the first aspect, let's assume we're just going to do that anyway, Jeremy, and we'll make sure that happens. Keith, then, then Mark. Yeah, I mean, I think on the very narrow point, I agree with Jeremy that we should try and uh, make this as widely known as possible. I don't agree. I think it's a frankly ridiculous proposition. This is somehow the fault of the Scottish Government in any way whatsoever, but that's politics for you. Um, I'd also have some difficulty with the idea that we should try and warn people it's about to happen, but pretend it's a good thing that's happening anyway. I don't understand the logic in that. But I think in doing that, in publicising this, I do agree with Jeremy's point about take-up and the point that Mark made. But... The language that Jeremy used, and I'm, I'm sure it was inadvertent about this being a benefit, is part of the problem because the UK government is now moving towards describing various pension entitlements as benefits, or pensions as benefits. We know that's a disincentive for people to claim them because there's a, especially amongst older people, there's a, a thing about saying I'm going to get a benefit compared to, which they're entitled to, we all know that, but they have a thing about that, whereas pensions, they see it as an absolute entitlement. And I think we have to be clear, this is about pensions, uh, not about benefits. Of course, it affects benefits as well. So on the narrow point, I don't resolve from anything I said previously. I think we should write to the UK government in the terms that the conveners described with those additional points I would want to make. But I do agree with the point that we should publicise this as widely as possible because it will have an impact on people's lives. And in your subsequent point, convener, I don't know if that's what's... The 13th of August deadline refers to, or is that a different thing? Because I say you can make a backdated claim up to the 13th of August in paragraph three of the minister's letter. Mm. Yeah, so we, we should... I suppose the danger of promoting that is then people might just wait. I've got longer to wait before I, I, I seek to claim. But it's whether or not that, that then becomes the next line in the sand as well, I suppose. So, so that, that's something to consider. Mark, did you want to come in? Yep. I mean, I think there's general consensus around the tables that this isn't well known about at all. I think that was a consequence of when the decision was announced. I think it was on one of the, the meaningful votes day or a vote of confidence day um, that it was announced. So even if we are um, writing back to the, the minister, we could potentially in, include a, a request for it to be delayed by six months or whatever mm -hmm. the committee can coalesce around to give people mm -hmm. um, government um, more time to make people aware of this, aware of their entitlement and a chance to apply before they remove the support. I, I think that's a, a very constructive suggestion because we, we unfortunately did the nature of politics, isn't it? Um, we, we did split on, on this when we did our initial letters. Um, but, but the suggestion is that uh, without having our individual views about the policy intent of this, where we just disagree, um, that we ask for a, a six-month extension to both the 15th of May deadline and the 13th of August deadline, where both governments do all they can to maximise benefit uptake in relation to this, which is sitting at, at 40%. Do you think we could coalesce around that as a committee? I, I, I suppose I'm looking at Michelle and Jeremy because I suspect where other members can coalesce around that position. I'm just wondering if that's a position that our Conservative colleagues could coalesce around. 
I don't know what to think, really. I mean, it was announced years ago, you know. Um, it's just been re-raised recently, you know, reminded recently that it was happening. Um, I think there has been, obviously, very poor take-up. Um, the clarity of why, you know, some people obviously don't feel they need it. Other people are totally unaware of it. Um, some people, as Keith Brown has indicated, may feel, you know, you know, pride reasons or feelings of discomfort about going to the benefit system that they don't they don't want to claim it. Um, it. You know, it's complicated, and I just I don't know. I mean, it's a reserved matter. Um, you know, really, it's our colleagues in Westminster that should be talking to the government around if they feel that there's a need. I don't know whether there has been a clamour down there. I'm not aware of it, um, and I don't know that. You know, as writing at this point, this juncture is going to actually make any difference. I mean, I don't want to. I, mean, I want to try and get the consensus that we're trying to mm. secure. I'm, I'm conscious times against us as well here. Um, so, without going down the road of what is reserved or what is devolved, in terms of income maximisation and tackling poverty, mm. this committee sure. absolutely has ha has a role to play in how the social security system does or does not support that. Um, so you were very close to, to being minded to support that six-month extension, Michelle. It's too late, is my view. You know, I mean, if this was something that really bothered you, this should have been done ages ago. So. Well, uh, the, I think the point I would make is that as soon as this was drawn to the attention of this committee, we have moved speedily and effectively and efficiently on 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 this, I'm, I'm not going to speak speak ill of previous members of this committee or Conservative or Labour Party politicians at Westminster. What I want to focus on is mixed pensioner households who are at threat right now, and we want to try and protect them and drive up that 40% claimant rate as much as possible. So, even though you suspect it may not be a successful move, Michelle, can I ask whether you would uh, co? Uh, we probably would support a I'll letter support calling a letter for that, that says, extension. I'll support a letter that says uh, we're concerned that there has been a very low rate of take-up on this benefit and that there hasn't been sufficient information out there. Um, and, you know, if you want to call that the government delay it, you know, do I care one way or the other? Probably not, actually, if I'm really honest, because I'm not sure you'll necessarily get a rush of take-up unless you do some really good work around advertising it. But, yeah, if you want to write, that's fine. Can I thank you for that? Because that means mm -hmm. we've got consensus on that. Jeremy, can I just check with yourself? Yep. OK. And can we word the letter in, a, in, a, in an appropriate fashion that, that, that keeps all members of the com committee satisfied? And, of course, in terms of that take-up of, of an entitlement, um, I, I don't distinguish between Scottish Government, UK Government or local authorities for that matter as well. So let's make sure we draw attention to all levels of government in relation to that. But a six-month extension from the UK Government of the May date and the, and the August date would give us a window to get that 40 per cent figure increased and protect some mixed pensioner households. And I'm delighted we'll be able to agree on that. OK? And the points which I understand are going to be contained within the letter as well. Uh, I, I, well... We haven't written the letter. We're discussing what the key principles will be. I think to give comfort to our Conservative members of the committee where we've got agreement, we have to note where it's a majority view, not the full committee, and to some of that stuff. But we'll make sure the content is included within it. It does refer to the Minister's letter and takes up the point with a triple lock. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. We should respond to that. I think it's also mm -hmm. true to say that we can't... That's a different issue. Well, it's not yeah. a if you want to explore letter. that, you can go on and explore the Minister's that letter. So, so, so it's a wider issue. What I would suggest mm -hmm. is that if we're asking the minister to come to the committee, that's an opportunity to speak more widely about that. I, I think we should... I mean, we're not, we're not drafting a letter by committee just now. We have to give the general principles of that letter, then you just have to empower me with the clerks to get it written and sent. Um, but let's make sure we note it. Uh, we invite the, the minister to our committee and we call for that six-month extension where we'll be able to actually coalesce across party political grounds. Can I give my apologies again? I have to go and ask a question. Yes. I as well. and can, can I suggest that if that concludes this particular agenda item, we're going to have to uh, not move to agenda item four, but just to close the meeting at that point and to return to our consideration of the evidence we've heard this morning? Well, I had, I mean, 
going to discuss item we're four. Still, we're, still, we're still in public at the moment. Uh, well, just, I tried to get in at the very end mm. with a question and information from the people that gave evidence. So if I, if I can raise it in that way, uh, Michelle Ballantyne has quoted Club Manager Council as having rent arrears, uh, universal credit arrears, which have gone up uh, as a result of the introduction of universal credit and going right. down. That is not my understanding based on the figures so, I have from Club Manager Council. So it would be useful to have from the people that were here their version of um, so, so we have we have moved on to consideration of evidence which would normally be in private. You've put that on, on the record. Let, let's let's look at that next week when we discuss that, that information in private. I think that's only reasonable. Okay, um, so we won't move to agenda item four. We'll close the meeting at that point. Thank you, members.